Good morning. I'm uh, Council Member Antonio Reynoso, Chair of the Committee on Sanitation and Solid Waste. Uh, I just want to make sure I inform the public that we'll be going into a short recess uh, of about 15 minutes waiting for the Chair of Transportation who's, uh, who's caught up. So uh, we're going to just take a small recess. Thank you. And I just want to recognize the members that are here, uh, Council Member Jimmy Vaca from the Bronx, Andy King from the Bronx, and Stephen Mario from Staten Island. Thank you.
And we are back. Thank you so much for your patience and for waiting. Uh, we will start the hearing. Uh, <clears throat> I'm again, Council Member Antonio Reynoso, the Chair of the Sanitation, the Committee on Sanitation and Solid Waste. Thank you for all being here today. And I'm pleased to co-chair this joint oversight hearing on private sanitation fleet safety with Council Member Danis Rodriguez, who will join us shortly, and the Committee on Transportation. Uh, Vision Zero makes it clear that the City of New York sees every traffic crash as preventable. The incidents can be systematically addressed and therefore no level of fatality on the city streets is acceptable. There have been several tragic fatal crashes involving private sanitation trucks and pedestrians or cyclists over the last few years. I have concerns about the safety of the private sanitation fleet, including the maintenance of trucks and the well-being and alertness of drivers and helpers. Today, I would like to learn how the city is systematically addressing these incidents and working to prevent future crashes. Garbage collection, whether handled by public or private haulers, is one of the most dangerous industries in this country. The drivers often work long hours, which can lead to a decline in cognitive function and slower reaction times. Drivers should have regular breaks during shifts and long breaks during driving, between driving shifts. Helpers should not be riding dangerously on the back of the vehicle. Trucks should be equipped with essential safety equipment. We must keep pedestrians, cyclists, and sanitation employees safe while they are providing this essential service. I look forward to understanding the current response to these crashes and how, as a city, we can do better in the future. I will now turn it over uh, to the Commissioner of BIC, uh, Commissioner Dan Brunel. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, Noah Gannell, who is the General Counsel, and Juan Martinez, uh, the Director of Policy for Traffic Operations at the Department of Sanitation. Um, take it away. Thank you. Oh, I would like to acknowledge the fact that we've been joined by Council Member Margaret Chin as well. Good morning, Chair Reynoso, uh, and when it gets here, Chair Rodriguez, <clears throat> members of the City Council Sanitation and Solid Waste Management and Transportation Committee, and of course, the Department of Transportation Committee. I am Dan Brunell, Commissioner of the New York City Business Integrity Commission, or BIC, joining me today our BIC's Deputy Commissioner of Legal Affairs and General Counsel, Noah Janelle, seated just um, behind us, or actually to my right, is BIC's Director of Policy, uh, Salvador Arana, Executive Agency Counsel, Emily Anderson, and Senior Legal An Analyst, Elise Ryan. Juan Martinez, Director of Policy for the Department of Transportation's Traffic Operations, and a key member of the Vision Zero Task Force is seated next to me to my immediately right, is also here uh, to provide testimony and answer questions. Thank you for inviting us here to testify today. I am here to provide you with an update on the many initiatives BIC has been spearheading to make the trade waste industry safer. In January 2014, Mayor Bill de Blasio announced his Vision Zero initiative to end traffic deaths and injuries in New York City. As part of the initiative, the city created a permanent Vision Zero task force. Headed by the Mayor's Office of Operations, the Vision Zero task force is comprised of key agencies and partners, including the New York City Police Department, Department of Transportation, Taxi and Limousine Commission, Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, Department of Citywide Administrative Services, the Metropolitan Transit Authority, and the city's various district attorney's offices, among other agencies. BIC joined the Vision Zero Task Force in 2016 and is honored to be a part of what is a total team effort. The Vision Zero Task Force meets every two weeks, and, a member, and the member agencies work together far more frequently to develop strategies in an effort to meet the mayor's bold goal of eliminating fatal and serious vehicular crashes. More than just a thick take, we develop policies and strategies that the city actually implements. Some of these plans have included improvement in street design, innovations and in enforcement of various rules and regulations, and public education. Early next year, the Mayor's Office of Operations will publish a Vision Zero Year 4 report that will track the progress of all the city agencies' efforts towards achieving Vision Zero. 
As part of the Vision Zero Task Force, TLC created a short video that sets the proper context, I believe, for today's conversation with regard to safety on our city streets. We will play that now. It's only about six minutes. He was riding his bike on the greenway. Henry had the green light. My mom kept screaming, she's no longer with us. She's no longer with us. And uh, I think I was, I remember feeling really, really overwhelmed. Like this is, there's no way this can be happening. There's no way. Renee Thompson, age 16, was hit and killed in the crosswalk by a turning truck. <laughs> she was coming home from her job at Dylan's Candy Bar. We know now that that definitely the car made a left turn, ran her over with the left front tire, and also ran her over with the rear tire too. So she was ran over twice that, that day. I guess one of the head doctors that was coming over to us. And I had to explain that they've been working on Ali for at least a half an hour. And they have to stop. And they were pumping her heart for half an hour, but it wouldn't start. And they gave her blood. But it wouldn't start. And I remember holding her arms and I said, take my blood. <laughs> she said it wouldn't work. Allison Liao, age three, was hit and killed in the crosswalk by a car making a left turn. She was holding her grandmother's hand. que si de repente se te va la vida es un dolor que no no tiene explicación es por qué porque a mi hijo porque murió de esa manera Jospel Rivera, age 23, was killed in a hit and run as he crossed the street. Jospel was left lying in the street for two hours before a person spotted him and called 911. And I went to go see my brother. <clears throat> I touched his face, kissed him. But that's it, you know? Someone's gone, they're just gone, just like that. There's nothing you can do. Asif Rahman, age 22, was struck and killed by a truck while he was riding his bicycle.
Vision Zero's goal is founded on the assertion that every death or serious injury involving a motor vehicle in New York is one too many. While data and statistics are important to help chart our progress in this effort, <clears throat> the focus is on protecting the life of everyone who lives, works, or visits our city. A month ago, we played this particular TLC video at the start of a gathering of trade waste industry members concerning safety. A number of participants commented that hearing the stories from the family members of the crash victims altered their thinking about what is at stake when they drive trucks on our city streets. Starting the event with this video also significantly changed the tenor of the panel discussions that followed. It fostered a productive environment to speak about these complex issues where people actually listen to each other as we talked about how best to make our streets safer. I want to talk more I want to speak more specifically about what BIC is doing to improve safety in the trade waste industry. BIC is part of the effort to create a zone collection structure for our local commercial waste collection. In September of 2016, New York City Department of Sanitation Commissioner Catherine Garcia and BIC held the first meeting to engage various groups in the conversation to develop this plan. While implementation of the commercial waste zone system will require thorough analysis and is still a few years off, the group decided that the concern for making the trade waste industry safer was an effort that could and should begin immediately. To that end, BIC and DSNY have formed the Commercial Waste Zone Collection Safety Working Group, or Working Group for short, and invited everyone from that initial stakeholder meeting to participate. In addition to members of city government, the group includes members of the trade waste industry, union leaders, and environmental and other advocates. The working group has met 10 times since November of 2016. Our initial project has been to create a universal safety manual that every carding company in the city will be expected to use as a guide to develop their own robust safety program. The meetings have been extremely productive. Impressively, even though the participants view various issues in the trade waste industry differently, we all can agree that safety is the priority. That notion has dominated the group's discussions. We are in the process of finalizing the safety manual and anticipate that it be, will be released in conjunction with the Vision Zero four-year report early next year with an initial version available electronically on BIC's website. The manual is quite comprehensive and covers everything from a checklist of things that drivers should do in their pre-trip and post-trip truck inspections to the safety equipment all trade waste trucks should have. For example, we focus significant attention on the latest truck camera technology and will continue to discuss whether it should be considered essential safety equipment on a truck. We also spent time identifying distractions for drivers on the road, like cell phones, and unusual occurrences on the street, and what drivers can do to manage those hazards to avoid crashes. Not surprisingly, anticipating problems and thinking through solutions to create a culture of safety at a trade waste company are the most effective means to improve safety and prevent tragedies on the road. Creating a universal safety manual is just the start for the working group. The group has already begun the next phase, which is to take key sections of the manual and develop the ideas into a video training curriculum that will be made available to all trade waste companies. 
The working group has members from the carding industry and government agencies, particularly DSNY, that have experience in delivering trade waste safety trainings. We are pooling this collective expertise to build a library of video trainings that are interactive, personal, and engaging. We are also tapping into the video production skills of the Vision Zero Task Force to make the videos a reality. The overall goal of both the manual and the videos is to ensure that every trade waste company operating in the city creates a culture of safety with specific procedures and protocols to better protect their workers and the public. As BIC has engaged in these safety initiatives, it has been clear that we need to make significant additions to our rules to increase our effectiveness in the area of ind industry safety. We anticipate such rule updates will not only compel all carding companies to adopt what the working group has determined to be critical safety measures, but also will create more enforcement options for us to more effectively push carters to operate more safely. In 2015, BIC established a group called the Trade Waste Advisory Board, an idea from an earlier administration that had fallen into disuse over the years. The board is comprised of leaders from several trade waste carding companies and trade waste organizations, along with myself and several members of my staff. We meet monthly to discuss topics in the industry and issues about BIC regulation. These meetings have been highly productive and have helped to develop a relationship of trust and respect among the board members with the knowledge that we are all working toward a common goal of making this industry better. The topic of industry safety has always been a major component of our discussions. In fact, in the 20 meetings that we have held since November of 2015, shortly after the board was formed, the issue of safety has been featured at every meeting. Early on, the board decided to regularly organize safety symposia with the intention of engaging trade waste company owners, managers, drivers, and helpers in conversations about critical industry safety issues. The symposia have been semi-annual events attended by many members of the trade waste industry. We have had well over 100 attendees at each of the three symposia held to date. The symposia have addressed topics such as distracted driving, creating a culture of safety at trade waste companies, counterterrorism considerations in the trade waste industry, and improving safety for drivers and helpers specifically. At the most recent symposium on October 24th of 2017, I opened the gathering by discussing results from a recently released DOT study about that showed that while bicycle trips in the city have increased by 150% in the last few years, fatalities and serious industries, in injuries to cyclists have significantly dropped. The study concludes that the dramatic increase of bicycle fatalities on city streets, particularly bike lanes, over the last 10 years is likely the greatest contributor to this drop. Two of the panel discussions that followed my remarks were especially pertinent to this issue. The per first panel, the first was a panel moderated by Juan Martinez of DOT to my right that brought together trade waste truck operators, the executive director of transportation alternatives, and DOT's head of bicycle projects. The second was a panel with two members of the NYPD's collision investigation squad that conducted case studies of three past crashes involving trade waste trucks. It became a group discussion among audience members to evaluate what could have been done differently in each case to prevent similar tragedies in the future. The question of who is to blame was not the point. The goal was prevention going forward. While attendance at the three symposia has been good, the audience comprised only a small percentage of the overall industry. We continue to look for ways to reach a higher percentage of the industry with future events. The next symposium will be in the spring, likely focusing on safety equipment available for trucks. You are all invited. In addition, we are planning a separate event geared specifically to drivers and helpers 
at a time and location most convenient for their difficult schedules. Two years ago, BIC began to take on the improvement of safety in the trade waste industry as a priority. This is the first in the 20-year life of this agency. For those of you on the Transportation Committee who may not know much about BIC, it was created in response to a series of criminal prosecutions in the 1990s that proved that the trade waste industry was completely controlled by organized crime. Then Mayor Giuliani reasoned that putting industry leaders in jail alone would not stop the systematic corruption. City Council legislation created my agency, then known as the Trade Waste Commission, to enforce a stringent licensing structure in the industry with a ro robust backgrounding process to identify and eliminate the corrupt actors by denying them a license or registration to operate. Under the Bloomberg administration, our name was changed to the Business Integrity Commission after also taking on regulatory authority over the city's public wholesale food markets. We are a small law enforcement agency staffed by investigators, auditors, attorneys, and background analysts with a small squad of NYPD detectives. Our main focus has always been investigations of those in the carding industry and public wholesale markets, both in the context of making our regulatory decisions and in many criminal investigations and the many criminal investigations that we conduct with other law enforcement and prosecutorial agencies at all levels of government. BIC was specifically tasked to enforce and maintain integrity in the trade waste industry, acting as the gatekeeper against corrupt carding companies in New York and keeping the trade waste industry open and competitive. Elimination of corruption has been our main goal with a focus on protecting the, car the carding customer, not occupational health and safety, and the safety of the public as a whole. But in keeping with the strong mayoral policy of Vision Zero, BIC, along with many other city agencies, has added safety as one of our top priorities. Not surprisingly, given the purpose for which BIC was created, our section of the administrative code says little about safety. Title 16A grants us nebulous powers to establish standards for compliance with safety and health measures in the trade waste industry but the overall regulatory scheme is focused on eliminating corruption and consumer protection for the trade waste customers. Before we update our rules to enhance BIC's ability to regulate the carters in the area of safety, we want to work with you, Chair Reynoso, and your committee in the coming new term to update our section of the administrative code to ensure that it, that it authorizes all of the additional safety measures we contemplate for the industry. Such action will better arm us to prevail over the legal challenges that will likely follow the addition of our new safety rules. As I noted, we want to foster industry-wide use of the Universal Safety Manual for trade waste companies and the production of the corresponding training videos. It is likely we will need mandatory measures in place to ensure that companies are actually using the materials and creating their own safety plans. Also, with the rapid development of improved safety equipment and technology in this industry, we are considering the possibility of making certain new truck safety equipment standard. This action would be similar to Local Law 56 of 2014, which made side guards mandatory for certain vehicles by 2024. Additionally, we want to develop reporting requirements that put the onus on carters to inform BIC promptly when their vehicles are involved in a serious crash with severe consequences for non-compliance. Drawing from the collective effort of the Vision Zero Task Force, BIC is establishing an interagency collision review panel. After any crash involving a vehicle operated by a BIC licensed or registered company that results in a fatality or serious injury, BIC will convene a review panel consisting of representatives from BIC and other city agencies to examine the contributing factors that led to the crash. The goal is to, exact, is to extract lessons from the tragic events for the industry and for city agencies to use, for use to make policy and operational decisions.
Bic also has established an internal response team to receive notification of serious crashes involving trade waste vehicles. This process helps us stay informed of these events and where necessarily formulate a response. Receiving this information also allows us to ma maintain our own statistics regarding safety in the trade waste industry. Lastly, we have, we have been regularly issuing safety bulletins to the trade waste industry. We send them out to an, an email, email blast and they are also available on our website. In closing, I want to thank you, Chair Reynoso, for your commitment to move all of us forward in developing the best and most efficient ways to deal with the city's solid waste disposal issues. The challenges are daunting, <clears throat> but what I particularly appreciate about your leadership is that you include all sides and perspectives in the conversations we are having, from zone collection to trying to even out truck traffic for all areas of the city. While the safety considerations I have discussed today are relatively new for BIC, we have a lot to contribute on this topic and look forward to expanding the role. With regard to the Transportation Committee, I also appreciate your interest in BIC safety initiatives, and I am happy to meet with any of you at any time and discuss any issues that you think are important with regard to the trade waste industry. Lastly, I want to address the representatives of the public and the advocacy groups that are present today. As I have said, BIC is a small law enforcement agency whose core mission has always been weeding out and keeping out corruption. As part of our commitment to improving the industry, we are now taking on more active roles in other areas of trade waste, such as recycling and safety, but we cannot do it alone. I have a total of 10 BIC investigators available for enforcement. Our first investigative priority must be background investigations on the applicants for licenses and registrations. That having been said, three of our 10 investigators are now assigned solely to conducting investigations into violations of the new recycling rules. To date, we have issued 16 such violations and are working on others. To settle these violations, we are requiring hefty penalties. To be as effective as possible with the limited resources we have, we need tips from the public and advocates in the industry about carters who are breaking our rules and regulations. We have reached out to advocates, including many present here today, and have gotten few leads. We have created a link on our website to encourage generators with information to email us, but so far that has yielded little. So my investigators have been trolling the streets at night. When lucky, we find carters breaking the recycling rules and issue administrative violations. There is a better way to do this, but it must include all of us. Holding carters responsible for their bad driving is of, greater, of, of even greater concern than the recycling violations. The consequences of such safety violation are far more dire and immediate, with the potential to result in death or serious injury. Like it or not, you, the public, are the best eyes and ears on the street to catch unsafe drivers. Our contact information is on our website. Let us know if you see these things. Report information anonymously if you are, not, if you are more comfortable. If you provide us with your contact information, we will get back to you with the results of our investigation while also concealing your identity. We know that some companies create unsafe working conditions for their employees by overloading their routes or pressuring drivers to complete them too quickly. Some of the trucks may not be properly maintained or critical safety equipment may not be functioning. Those in the labor force of this industry know best when these things are happening. Report it to us. Again, it can be anonymous. Improving safety on our streets is a job for all of us. It is counterproductive to take sides when it comes to these critical issues. We must all work together to make a real impact. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Commissioner. Now, DOT um, will be making a statement. I just want to make sure I acknowledge 
Uh, we've been jo joined by Councilmember Menchaca of Brooklyn and Councilmember Debbie Rose of Staten Island. Juan? Good morning, Chair Reynoso, members of the Sanitation and Transportation Committees. I'm Juan Martinez, Director of Traffic Operations Policy at DOT. Thank you for inviting me on behalf of Commissioner Trottenberg to discuss trade waste industry street safety. Thank you. Uh, nearly four years ago, Mayor de Blasio set a goal of eliminating traffic deaths and serious injuries. It was and remains an ambitious commitment, but we are encouraged by our progress. In 2016, 68 fewer people were killed in traffic crashes than in 2013, the year before the mayor launched Vision Zero. The last four years have been the safest four years in the city's history. While fatalities declined 23% in New York City, everywhere else in the United States, traffic fatalities went up 15%. Our progress on this complex, multi-dimensional public policy problem is attributable in large part to the city's data-driven Vision Zero strategy. The members of the Vision Zero task force analyze crash data and other evidence to target the causes of serious injuries and deaths, identify and implement countermeasures, monitor the effectiveness of those interventions, and revise our approaches accordingly. Ever since BIC began to participate in the task force, we've been taking a close look at fatal crashes involving trucks which are used by trade waste licensees. What follows are some of the notable findings from our analysis of these quote unquote trade waste industry truck fatal crashes and how key Vision Zero strategies address some of the predominant factors in those crashes. Since 2010, there have been 43 people killed in crashes involving BIC registered and non-BIC registered trade waste industry trucks. These trucks the trucks involved in these crashes include packer trucks, roll-on, roll-off trucks, and dump trucks. Although only 31 of these crashes involved a trade waste industry truck, which was registered with the Business Integrity Commission, for the purposes of today's discussion, we will focus on the 43 fatalities, since there are lessons that can be applied to all operators of these particular trucks. Of the 43 people killed, 32 were pedestrians, six were riding a bicycle, four were motor vehicle drivers or passengers, and one was operating a motorcycle. These 43 fatalities represent one quarter of the 175 fatal crashes involving all types of trucks, public and private, during the same period. Overall, 2,022 people were killed by vehicle crashes in New York during the same period. 90% of fatal pedestrian crashes involving trucks utilized by the trade waste industry occurred on or in a Vision Zero priority corridor, intersection, or area. The geographies which NYPD and DOT identified in the 2015 Borough Pedestrian Safety Action Plans as locations where pedestrian deaths and severe injuries are significantly overrepresented. With the help of every council member on these committees, the city has implemented an array of safety measures at these high crash locations, including a record number of street redesigns, record number of bicycle lanes with an emphasis on physically protected bicycle lanes, the lowering of the speed limit, concentration of our speed camera enforcement, red light camera enforcement, and police enforcement, the retiming of traffic signals to reduce overnight speeding, the addition of leading pedestrian intervals, and much more. In the years prior to Vision Zero, there were typically 99 pedestrian deaths annually at these priority locations. Last year, there were 73 pedestrian deaths, a 25% decrease. The city's continued focus on these streets will serve to prevent trade waste industry truck fatal crashes as well. Approximately 4% of pedestrian travel occurs during overnight hours from midnight through 6 a.m yet 17% of all pedestrian fatalities in New York City occur during those same hours. This statistic is even more disproportionate when it comes to crashes involving trade waste industry trucks, which by the nature of their business often operate at night. 10 of 32 fatal pedestrian crashes, or 31%, occurred between 12 a.m. and 6 a.m. DOT has implemented a series of countermeasures in an effort to prevent severe overnight crashes. These include the conversion to LED streetlights, which provide better color contrast, make pedestrians more visible, 
This project is well underway and expected to be completed by February of 2019. And DOT recently installed additional lighting at 1,000 intersections with high rates of pedestrian nighttime crashes. We expect to complete another 1,000 intersections by January 2020. Furthermore, DOT has sought to discourage speeding during the evening and overnight hours by recalibrating our traffic signals to ensure a safe progression aligned with the 25 mile an hour speed limit. Through 2016, DOT has retimed over 300 miles, or 72% of all priority corridor miles so far. And over the past year, NYPD officers who are on patrol during overnight hours, particularly in Manhattan, have been directed to focus on trade waste industry trucks and will continue to do so in 2018. Operator turns were a factor in 38, 13 of 38 fatal bicycle and pedestrian trade waste industry trucks since 2010, 34%. As a comparison, approximately 25% of all bicycle and pedestrian fatal and severe injury crashes in New York City involve vehicle turns. DOT has implemented a number of solutions to prevent severe injuries from turning crashes across the city. In 2016, we launched our left turn traffic calming pilot program, which has installed treatments at over 100 intersections. These treatments have been shown to reduce left turn speeds by 24%. Leading pedestrian intervals are another key element of our toolkit, and they have been installed at over 2,000 intersections since the launch of Vision Zero. This treatment has been shown to reduce severe injuries and deaths to pedestrians and bicyclists by over 60%. That should read in involving turning crashes. In turning crashes, it's reduced 60%. Got it. NYPD has tripled enforcement of failure to yield from 9,900 tickets annually before Vision Zero to over 33,000 in 2016. In addition, last year, NYPD issued over 1,900 summonses and made 39 arrests of drivers who carelessly caused crashes by failing to yield. These enforcement actions were made possible because of the right of way law enacted by the council and mayor in 2014. These efforts are not specifically targeted at trade waste industry trucks, but because these trucks are involved in a greater proportion of fatal crashes involving turns, all of these efforts can have a disproportionate safety benefit in this industry. Nations and cities around the world which have adopted Vision Zero goals have found success by initially concentrating on professional drivers in large fleets. Professional drivers and the organizations which employ them tend to have a higher commitment to safety and be more likely to rapidly improve their conduct than individual drivers. This is true here as well as our experience with the largest fleets in this city indicates. DCAS manages or sets policies for vehicles in the city's fleet. In order to advance Vision Zero, the agency has focused on training and technology. Before Vision Zero, just over 3,000 of the city's authorized drivers had completed a full day crash prevention course. Today, that number is over 43,000, and all authorized drivers are required to retake the course every three years. Participants in this course were asked about safety equipment that is important to add to city vehicles including cameras and automatic braking systems. DCAS has incorporated that feedback into the Safe Fleet Transition Plan, which is informing the crash prevention technology which will be incorporated into city vehicles. An element of the Safe Fleet Transition Plan, which is especially relevant here, is side guards, which are panels that can be added to trucks with large ground clearance to prevent pedestrians and bicyclists from being run over by a turning truck's rear wheels. Prior to Vision Zero, no New York City trucks had side guards, and very few trucks had them nationally. But today, over 1,250 trucks in the city's fleet have side guards, and their use is growing nationwide. This combination of training and technology has contributed to a 36% decline in the rate of injury crashes involving city vehicles. TLC is implementing similar strategies for the four hire vehicle fleet. Each prospective operator must first undergo 24 hours of taxi school, including a thorough exploration of safety strategies. Over 37,000 drivers completed the course in 2016 alone. TLC has conducted over 500 direct outreach efforts to fleet owners at bases and garages in the form of a driver outreach meetings program to emphasize safety education. 
TLC is also innovating by focusing on driver fatigue and is currently implementing newly passed rules that seek to prevent acute and chronic fatigue among for hire vehicle drivers. These rules were developed after a review of scientific research on fatigued driving, best practices in other transportation and safety sensitive industries, and an analysis of the data on TLC's own driver licensees. Finally, when it comes to trade waste industry fleet safety, the NYPD Citywide Traffic Task Force, which is responsible for on-street truck inspections, have been paying particular attention to this in the sector and is preparing to perform even more inspections in 2018. Thank you again to the committees for inviting us today, and I would be happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you for your testimonies. I'm extremely encouraged by, by the testimony that I'm hearing today. Um, a little concerned, we only have till 2020 to get to zero. Um, and I know that in, especially in Department of Transportation's testimony, um, it speaks to 43 fatalities and giving a, a, giving a, a percentage that is extremely low um, when we talk about the bigger picture here. But again, it's vision zero, not vision one, not vision two. It's vision zero, so that 43 is significant to us, and we've seen actually an increase, or we feel we've been seeing an increase. I want to thank the folks in Transportation Alternatives, Streets Blogs, and a lot of these um, independent uh, streets advocates that are really starting to bring attention to an issue that we think is of, is of huge concern. Um, so just regarding the last two years, 20, well, this year and last year, 2017 and 2016, how many crashes involving private sanitation carters have there been? Um, do we keep track of that? And if we do, how many have there been? So there have been eight fatal crashes from, from 2016 through present day involving private carters. Uh, trucks in the industry, including vehicles which are registered with BIC and those that are not, but of the type that are used by BIC licensees the roll-on, roll-off trucks, the private tenant, the collectors, the packers, that sort of thing. Uh, are there any investigations regarding these crashes or these fatalities? Every fatal crash and uh, many severe injury crashes are investigated by NYPD's Collision Investigation Squad. Uh, they have detectives who go out and uh, pull video, measure skid marks, download the vehicle's black box, and perform very thorough investigations of those of that class of crash. Uh, we do know less about uh, uh, crashes that don't result in serious injuries. Okay. And by the way, uh, Chair, what we do at BIC is we wait for the completion of the investigation by the, the, colli the NYPD's Collision Investigation Unit, and then mm -hmm. we take action and do what we think is appropriate. All right. So I'm, I'm actually very interested in the capacity that BIC currently has to, to investigate uh, possible crashes by the trade waste industry and using their authority as the licensee to a lot of these trucks um, to, to hold them accountable. But you state that in the charter, you have a very broad and vague uh, take on safety or opportunity to take on safety. Right. The concern is, and Noah can speak to this much more <clears throat> authoritatively than I can, but mm -hmm. the, when the legislation under Title 16 was drafted, the, the focus really was, you know, corruption and integrity right. in the industry. And while we have a long list of things that we want to put in our rules and some additional things that would have to go into the legislation itself, making it clear by amending and updating the legislation that um, this kind of safety is very much in, uh, is part of BIC regulation, just makes it much more efficient. So what was the original name of the BIC Integrity Commission when it first existed? It was the Trade Waste Commission. The Trade Waste Commission. Right, because it was only the trade waste industry. The fish market, the produce market, those were all, to the extent there was regulation, it was all small business services. So your authority has been modified or expanded to some degree exactly I, I believe it was at the I think it was at the very beginning of the Bloomberg administration that the wholesale markets were added into um, <clears throat> my agency's repertoire and therefore you couldn't keep it trade waste anymore you had to expand the name okay um, thanks for that thank you for that information um, 
So you, you mentioned an email that you send out regarding safety opportunities for uh, the private sanitation industry. Um, can you just explain what it is that you're sending and what authority, I guess, you have to send that and, and also whether or not it's just an initiative you're taking on independent of your authority? Um, I'll answer that, Council Member. Um, so we send out periodic safety bulletins to the industry through an email blast. I think that it, it's part of our uh, communication with the industry and our ability to uh, regulate the industry. Our, um, for example, over the summer, we sent out an email basically saying it's lighter later and people are out in the streets, people are, are going out to restaurants and bars and while you're driving your truck, so be careful. Uh, when it came to back to school, we sent out another email saying, you know, people's schedules have changed. It's, there's going to be kids in the streets going back to school. Uh, it gets darker earlier, and so things to pay attention to. And we've been doing that periodically with the change of seasons. We also sent out, uh, I believe in that same bulletin, there was something about drowsy driving uh, to make sure that your drivers are uh, paying attention to that. Uh, there was a study that I think we referenced in the bulletin about uh, connection with NFL football games and the day after those games, there being an increase in drowsy driving. So we wanted to call attention to that. So, so knowing that, that information, especially let's say the NFL football game situation, um, one, it's not mandatory that anybody read this email or look through it, right? It's just you doing your part and trying to get them to, to see it. This video, for example, I think would have been a great thing for every single driver in the city of New York, not only uh, the TLC drivers and not only um, the trade waste industry to see. Um, but knowing that, I, I'm hearing from many workers that they're asked to, to work long hours and to do routes um, that have the, a number of business that makes it almost impossible, outside of being the flash, to be able to handle those, those pickups. So they drive faster, they roll through stop signs, they do things that are more dangerous just to keep their jobs. They don't want to lose their jobs and they have to, and they have to follow through. In some cases, if they go over the amount of, let's say it's an eight hour day, if they do nine or 10 hours to complete their route, they don't get paid those extra two hours that are overtime. So they're trying to get it done in eight hours and doing so making it a dangerous situation. What, what, what do you do to prevent the, the trade waste industry from putting uh, these drivers in those dangerous situations where they're being asked to do more than is, is, is uh, uh, possible. So there's no question that those kinds of things are happening. There's probably also no question that to a large extent those are the things that lead to the crashes that result in serious injury or, or death. And that's precisely the kinds of things that we need to have in our in new updated rules and in legislation, similar to what TLC is doing now with regard to setting maximum um, shift times to do that. And then take other measures to the extent we can um, to ensure that managers of trade waste companies aren't uh, continuing to overload drivers in terms of how many runs they have on any particular shift. These are all things we need to look into. I'm not sitting here like I'm an expert on all this stuff, mm -hmm. and that's where having input from the industry in terms of how the thing functions so that when we do actually sit down and draft out rules and legislation that we're actually going to have things that are effective. Okay. I'm going to ask two more questions because I want to allow for my colleagues to ask questions as well. Um, <clears throat> Local Law 56 of 2015 says that there should be side guards on all of the industry vehicles by 2024. So th to date, what is the percentage of vehicles that now have side guards? I don't know. Sal is going to have, Sal, why don't you just grab the mic? Sal from our um, agency was the one with DCAS and DOT that worked on this federal program, and I think he's going to have some idea. So I. Hello, my name is Salvador Rona. I'm the Director of Policy at the Business Integrity Commission. Uh, Councilmember Reynoso, in order to answer your question, of the number of companies that participated in the rebate program that the Commissioner referred to, you know, it was a program, um, it was BIC, it was DOT, it was DCAS. In the fiscal year 2016, the number of private carding companies that took advantage of this rebate program were eight. Uh, the number of trucks with side guards installed were 18. For fiscal year 2017, 
Uh, the number of private carding companies uh, were 14, and the number of trucks with side guards were 70. Okay, so just want to ask, you would agree that's an extremely low number? Yes. Okay, um, and at this rate, uh, so, so for us, 2024 is, is a long Six way away. Six years away. But at this rate, if we get you know 10% of the industry at this rate done, we'll be we'll be it'll be a lot. It'll be an accomplishment. Right, and you know without <clears throat> getting too pessimistic, my guess is that we're not going to be getting a lot more federal money for this, mm -hmm. as we did before. And you know maybe one of the things to look at. My recollection is when in, and when this law was being discussed, I had just come to BIC and knew absolutely nothing about this stuff. And I, I, re I remember hearing a concern that in terms of what was available on the market was somewhat limited and especially being be able to provide that in large numbers. Yeah. My guess is, better than my guess is, that that has largely changed at this point, even in just three years. Yeah. So that probably, if we're, if, we're, if we're really going to look to add um, critical and important things to rules and regulation, uh, rules and legislation. We me, we may very want to well want to up the date from 2024. That's six years yes. from now. I, I agree with that. Um, I, Count, I'm very interested. Interested. Yeah, sorry. May I also just say so that's 88 total trucks that where the companies have taken advantage of the rebate program. That does not mean that there's necessarily only 88 trucks right. that have side guards on them. I don't have the statistic yeah. here today, but what Mr. Arona was talking about was the rebate program. So there was a program that if you act early, uh, you can get a rebate to, to pay, help pay for the side guard. So there were 88 total trucks that have side guards as a result of that program. Right. I just know the trade waste industry to be very fiscally responsible and given that there is a rebate um, almost free money to take care of this issue that they would take advantage of it so i'll be hard pressed to see even one or two trucks that are haven't taken advantage of the rebate program actually have these side guards installed it's no, just and, an and assumption and apparently they are really really effective I, I i've seen videos of them i i agree with you i've advocated on behalf of this for a long time and i'm glad to see we're making some progress um then just uh I have information here that over a two-year period, an average of 48% of all trucks were taken out of service due to maintenance problems um, when, when BIC inspected them, I guess. That purport, that's more than double the national average. Yeah, um, is I that, does that statistic... I don't, I don't interrupt, but I don't know that we would have done that inspection. It depends so, what it was for. I'm hearing... So, I guess, who does the inspection of the trucks on whether or not they're well-maintained or they're up to code, I guess? DOT, BIC? It wouldn't, it wouldn't be us on most things. Like the side guards, when that comes into effect, mm -hmm. certainly when the emission rules in 2020 come down, we'll do some of that. I, may, I would imagine DOT probably does some things. Okay, so we're going we're gonna to look into, I'm going to look into seeing who has that authority. Again, I'm very interested in seeing a couple of things you talked about, especially legislation to reduce our mandatory hours of a driver being able to work. Um, and remember, it's not just the hours, it's the amount of work they have to do within that, those exactly. hours. Exactly. Make it impossible. If they're working for four hours, but they're driving around like, you know, crazy in the streets, that's no good. Yeah. Uh, and then for DOT, uh, Metropolitan and Grand Street, uh, that intersection specifically, but Metropolitan and Grand Street, um, both routes are heavy truck routes in my district. And in those truck routes, I'm seeing an increased number of pedestrian deaths or fatalities. I'm extremely concerned that uh, over the last three years in my time there, there have been three deaths on Grand Street, for example, and DOT has yet to, to do anything to modify uh, those intersections or those, those two truck routes. Uh, but in that time, we've actually seen an increase in uh, uh, biker uh, summonses by the NYPD and seen uh, a, a disproportionate amount of summonses to truck, the truck drivers. So while the truck, the trucks are killing people, they don't get summonsed for it or there's very little enforcement done to them. And then when it comes to the bikers who are the ones dying, they're the ones being, being asked to, to, to get, take on summonses. Um, I just want to know where the conversation happens within the task force that BIC is now a part of, that I'm glad to hear they're a part of, 
um, where, where that translates into effective uh, you know, encouragement of, of street safety, I guess, or, 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 or driver safety? Uh, well, in regards to, to Grand Street in particular, uh, we have been, we've been refining a plan for the corridor for some time. We uh, are trying to accommodate the up upcoming shutdown of the L train and trying to figure out how to make sure that that plan works uh, with the anticipated number of buses that are going to be required to move people uh, along Grand Street and uh, make sure that it works for local businesses and so on. But in, in your district, with the L train shutting down, uh, bikes are going to be a big part of the, the story about how people move around. And so uh, increasing safe mobility on Grand Street for bicyclists is a priority, and, and you should hear more from us on that uh, before too long. Uh, and Right. When it comes to Metropolitan, when it comes to Grand Street, when it comes to Meeker Avenue, when it comes to other major corridors in North Brooklyn, all over the city, what we have been doing is trying to uh, civilize the interactions between uh, trucks, cars, people, people on bikes, people walking, right? It's a complicated endeavor. Uh, what we found is slowing everybody down a bit helps dramatically. Uh, we can, when vehicles are going slower, they're more likely to be able to avoid a collision, and when that collision does occur, it's less likely to be a fatal one. Also separating uh, phases, so allowing pedestrians to go at a different time as turning vehicles with the LPIs, uh, or separating modes, allowing bicyclists their own safe space. And, and keeping them separate from vehicle traffic. Uh, but it's, it's all of it at once. And, uh, and if there's anything in particular that we need to be working more closely on, we'll follow up with your office. Yeah, I just really want you to focus on enforcement. We have more trucks in North Brook than possibly almost anywhere in the city of New York outside of Hunts Point. And they have by per capita, I guess I want to say, per truck, the exact same amount of violations as, let's say, a truck in, in the middle of Brooklyn, in central Brooklyn. Um, but the bike summonses have gone up. Um, so I just want to know, just saying that there's, a, a, there's a, a misunderstanding of what enforcement should be. And given that the trucks are the ones killing people, maybe we should talk about it, more enforcement for them and not the bicyclists. Um, and I'll kind of, I, I, you don't even need to answer that question, uh, but I want to allow for, of course, uh, Chair Rodriguez uh, to ask a few questions before my colleagues get an opportunity as well. So thank you for your testimony. I'm looking forward to um, making a lot of these changes in the future, especially legislatively for BIC, to consider uh, giving them authority to do a lot more in this, in this area. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Reynoso, for co-chairing this hearing. I'm sorry that I couldn't be here from the beginning, but both my council member Van Bremen and I, we were at another meeting since early this morning. Uh, first of all, my thanks to the men and women who work so hard picking up our garbage. It doesn't matter if they represent the big one or they are like a small one uh, who are providing a good services to our city. And I know that everyone is in the business to keep our city safe. There's no enemies in this room. This is all about behind the men and women who are driving a truck. There's two children, there are three children who live in Queens, who live in Staten Island, who live in Brooklyn, that is walking the street. And we want to be sure that they're safe. And we appreciate all the advancement, advancement that we have made on Vision Zero. However, we are not close to accomplish a goal. And the data speaks to itself as we are getting close to the end of the year. So I think that you know we only have one choice, which is to keep working together to identify a way on how our streets is safe for everyone. It's not about going after any particular sector, it's about bringing that sector to the table. And engage those sectors can be, you know, those drivers who again pick up our garbage, can be another members of the truck associations who also move our good in our city. My first question is about the rebate. Can you explain with detail what is the rebate? What is the incentive for those small owner of those companies to install the star guard. Chair, I'm going to have um, Sal Arona from BIC explain that because he was the one for our agency that led that effort. 
So Commissioner Bernal announced the rebate program in February of 2016. And so it was a voluntary program that offered each company who would participate a 50% rebate off the slide guard. And so we had a list of the vendors where they can get that side guard installed. And what is the total for those for, to install those side guard? What is the average cost to install those costs? I, I don't have that number with me. Any idea I, on hundreds, thousands, ten thousand? What is the estimate? I don't have the number, but I will get back to you. Okay. I just think that we need to look at the numbers because you know one issue what I have areas what I what area what I sometimes have issues about you know how we as a city can do better to increase the incentive to get what we need. Uh, like the pedestrian bowlers, that's one thing that I found out that it costs $500 every year per bowler. Uh, so if a non-for-profit wants to install for a hundred or fifty of them, there's like a yearly a, a, a fee that they have to pay. And I think that if we want to make our sidewalk safe, we as a city should provide incentive to get a waiver or to increase the incentive. So if this is something that we definitely want to, to increase the number of trucks. You know, at some point, if we need to increase it, we should be open to do it. How often do you meet to take the feedback of, those, of that sector of sanitation drivers uh, to this cause? <coughs> We meet, we have something called the Trade Waste Advisory Board, which meets once a month. Um, it has uh, members of BIC, including Commissioner Brownell and myself, as well as um, leaders of the industry, so um, top executives from several of the major carding companies, uh, and then uh, some representatives of associations, trade waste uh, groups that. Uh, that work in the industry. So we meet on a monthly basis to talk about um, big initiatives and to get feedback from uh, the trade waste industry. If the city organized uh, the pickup of garbage and instead of providing, instead of having all the small ones, you give it here to one or two, the big one, how will that have an impact on this? With regard to safety? Yes. So um, that obviously is one of the main aspects of the conversation with regard to the uh, zone collection um, effort that's going on now with BIC and mostly the Department of Sanitation. And one of the advantages of the zone collection model, I would think, would be a greater ability to mandate safety equipment for the trucks of those particular trade waste companies that have actually won bids and are picking up commercial garbage in the city. Do you feel like a level of cooperation among those who represent the, those, the drivers of those truck who pick out the garbage, sanitation truck drivers when it comes to increasing the safety in our streets? Some. I mean, better, more than some. Um, a lot. Obviously, for the industry, um, safety is also a concern, and we have many members that work very hard for that. Um, but it's not everywhere, and you know some companies just aren't good. Um, they have other priorities, um, and that's when you know that's when things get in trouble. Okay, thank you. I will continue again working with my colleague, who chair the committee of sanitation as a chairman of the other transportation committee. I will continue doing the best I can with my colleagues to be sure that we share our street and that was is saving that we understand that pedestrian and cyclists should be a top priority. It doesn't matter if we drive a truck or I drive a car. We are the ones who are behind the wheel, you know, of objects that weight tons. So we need to be sure that, again, you know, always go extra mile in doing our part to keep our city safe. Thank you. So, Chair, I know that you and I have never interacted together. We've never met, but my invitation and request to you is if you have concerns and you'd like to meet, you should not hesitate to pick up the phone or send me an email, and I'd be happy to meet with you. And as you know, the reason has been probably because in DOT has been, you know, with the commissioner, uh, Polly and the borough commissioner, but more than happy, like, uh, again, we are getting closer this year, and we have made progress but the data is not the best one. 
that we have, and this is about Vision Zero overall. Like what we learned this weekend, that a 14 years old, undocumented teenager being killed, being the only source of their family to support himself and support them back in the country. You know, I know that they, all of us have our compassion, have compassion for the rest of brothers and sisters in the city. And we know that the number that we have right now of how many New Yorkers that they die because they've been killed in many cases by responsible and criminal drivers. Those are few apple that they don't, they don't represent the majority. I know that the majority of us, it doesn't matter the sector that we drive for, it can be livery, it can be individual drivers, we still can do better. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Chair. I want to acknowledge uh, Councilmember Constantinides, Richards, and uh, Grodnik, uh, who also joined us, and now we have questions. Um, and Van Bremer was here and stepped out for a while, and so did uh, Councilmember Menchaca. Um, we have questions from King, Rose, and Chin in that order. So, Councilmember Andy King from the Bronx. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, welcome and good morning, Commissioner Brownwell, as well as Director Martinez. Morning. Um, to all the families who've had to suffer from the lost life of a family member, I offer my condolences and prayers as. Losing a loved one never goes away. Those emotions are with you every day. You try to adjust to a new reality. Uh, but today's conversation is about how do we have an oversight and a real conversation about accountability and what plans are being laid out or what has been done. Testimony today has been very informative, and I thank you gentlemen for the information that you've shared. Uh, however, I still have a number of questions that you can help me get clarity on. Um, if there's anything redundant, forgive me, but it's just, again, uh, the repetition allows remembrance. Um, so the first thing I just want to know, I was in the testimony, I know out of the number of death accidents, it said 31 of the trucks were big registered. Um, but i just like to get an idea, would you be able to tell me how many trucks are actually on the road? Would you have that number at all? How many big trucks are, are actually, actually on, on the road? Council Member King, in order to answer your question, um, we currently have uh, approximately 7, over 7,800 trucks that are registered with BIC. So that means that the company is either licensed or registered, and that each truck has a BIC-issued license plate. So mm -hmm. those are the orange plates that are on the side of the trucks, and that's in addition to the DMV-issued license plate. Thank you. So out of 7,000, we're talking about 31 ended in death fatality. Okay. Um, another couple of questions that I do have. Um, are there any safety measures or criteria put in place before a person gets behind the wheel, um, before they start their day? That's one question. I'm going to give you a couple, and y'all can figure out how to answer them. All right. And it's not for any one particular, but to the panel in general. That's my first question. Second one, what happens immediately after an uh, accident occurs? Are there any timelines that BIC gets involved? Um, at the scene, however. Third, um, accidents that have occurred, have you found that they're occurring in particular neighborhoods or communities more than other communities, whether it's a high pedestrian neighborhood or it's uh, a wealthier neighborhood or not a, or a poorer neighborhood? Um, where are these accidents occurring? Uh, uh, my fourth question was, is um, we talked about prevention. What kind of penalties do you suggest for prevention and does these penalties go at the driver or does it go strictly at the, the company? Um, uh, and my fifth question would be is uh, sanitation. You have sanitation trucks out there as well, whether they're part of this, the unions. How are the unions faring out as working with you all for our safety, any protocols that they're using that are working that can help in the private industry that's, that's out here as well? Um, and. I'm going to stop right there and let you go for it. <laughs> You're killing me. So I'm going to answer one, four, and five, and you're probably going to have to remember, to remind me what five is by the time I okay. get there. So in terms of measures, safety measures in place before drivers go out every, I guess, evening or night. So obviously all drivers in this industry have to have a CDL uh, by the de uh, state Department of Transportation, and, and there are things that they have to do, criteria they have to meet in order to get that. Um, 
the, the thing that we're trying to do, and I said a little bit th this in my testimony, was <clears throat> that when we had our initial zone collection stakeholder meeting uh, a year ago in September, one of the things that we decided to do immediately was to put together a safety group because that was something that didn't have to wait uh, for consultants to be brought on board to kind of navigate the group through the process. And so that group includes um, members of organized um, labor, um, advocates, environmental advocates. D Department of Sanitation has been a huge part of that, uh, those meetings. Uh, BIC, of course, and then others in the industry. And one of the things that we're putting together, which I, should be available, I would say, no later than two months from now on our website, is a universal um, safety manual, and one of the key things that's going to be in that manual are, are pre-trip and post-trip inspections that every driver and helper should be making with regard to the trucks. Obviously, testing the equipment to make sure that it's, you know, everything is working. That, um, and so that's going to be a critical part of that. And then I think switching to question five, um, you know, right now we don't, really have the ability once that is, or the I should say the uh, legal right to make that mandatory and that's definitely something that we need to work with um, the solid waste committee to work on legislation and rules so that um, companies are mandated to take the safety the universal safety manual that we'll put out and then based on sort of their own, you know, unique nature of their company, come up with their own safety protocols. And then we would, you know, probably working with Vision Zero, make sure that every company has actually come up with a comprehensive plan to do that. Um, and so that's, you know, one of the big things. And of course, I've completely forgotten what question four is. Uh, that's okay. Okay. Uh, we'll go to question four. I was asking in regards to um, I think you might have just shift four and five around. I was asking you about the penalties, um, and does it target the the driver or does it target the company? And I'll go back to one to get back to round number one, which connects to this, because depending on the state of a mind, state of mind of a driver getting behind the wheel when they start the day, might give us an idea what kind of day that driver is going to have. So that's what I was wondering if there's anything put in place either by you or by, you know, how do we evaluate a person's state of mind? Because driving, getting behind the wheel of any vehicle is different than coming and sitting at a desk and figuring out do I right. not engage or not engage today. So that's what I wanted to get an idea because that determines if I'm going to crash today or I'm going to drive a little faster today or I'm going right. to violate the rules today. You know, what kind of assessments are happening with our personnel before they get behind the wheel of a vehicle? So my sense is that the kinds of things that we would be looking to do is first of all ask those in the industry you know what's their experience in terms of um, what measures would actually be effective the transit authority i would imagine before a motorman gets in you know a subway at the beginning of his or her shift there are protocols there um, i would imagine tlc has some similar kinds of things and that's the great thing about being part of vision zero because you have access to this collective expertise and these kinds of things so that when you actually do come up with measures, they're going to work. Do so if I can, mm -hmm. why don't I have Noah answer question two? Okay. Which I think is the timeline after a crash. So um, when there is a crash involving a trade waste truck, the initial investigation and you know, the main investigation is done by the NYPD, so the uh, Collision Investigation Squad. They are on the scene as quickly as possible. They, you know, they have all of their own protocols. I have met with members of the Collision Investigation Squad. I know that it is a comprehensive investigation that they do. Um, we at BIC uh, get early notification as, as quickly as uh, DOT identifies it as being a tradeways truck involved crash. They've been emailing to us the details we have an internal response team, so I generally will get the emails and I will forward them to the people within BIC who need to know so that we can look into, do we know the driver's name, do we know the company, uh, and assess what's going on. But until the NYPD does its investigation, we do not get involved directly in the investigation, as the most important thing is to preserve the NYPD's investigation. Once that is closed, we can continue on with our own inquiry 
and we have been doing that, but uh, we have not been doing this protocol for that long, and the number of NYPD cases, you know, we, we stay in touch with NYPD to find out when those cases are closed, and then we will look into it uh, to do as much as we can. The way our code and rules are currently uh, organized, we don't, there's not a lot we can do directly against the drivers. There are other, for example, NYPD and the criminal justice system may have something to say about some of the crashes, but we, we can make a finding, which is a lengthy process and a difficult thing to do against a driver that he lacks good character, honesty, and integrity. That would be an extreme measure. And then it's kind of an indirect thing because no trade waste company can employ somebody or do business with somebody who the commission has made that finding against. But that is not a direct way to handle these things. And so one of the things that we are contemplating is some interim measure, like being able to require the suspension of a driver while the investigation is pending. It's all very factual specific, and it's something that we're working on and, and looking into. Thank you. And my third question, I'm not, I'm not sure if I heard the answer yet. Did you find uh, regards to communities um, that there are, what are the locations, that there's more frequency in some communities or others? Uh, so in terms of a geographic concentration, not what you might expect. Uh, what is pretty consistent is that uh, in, in every borough, when you look at the priority corridors, intersections, and areas, right, this is a tiny fraction of our streets. Eight to 10% of the streets in any borough uh, are, account for 51% of fatal pedestrian uh, or fatal or severe injuries to pedestrians, right? 2% uh, of the intersections, 15% of the pedestrian fatal and serious injury crashes, right? And so if you look at those areas, those locations, 90% uh, of cases uh, of, of pedestrian and bicyclist fatalities uh, involving these types of trucks are happening on those same streets. So on the one hand, that's, that's pretty encouraging because we already have identified these streets, we've been working on them, We've been deploying all these interventions. So let me let me just stop right stop right there. So if I'm understanding, you're saying the same neighborhood. So whether it's Brooklyn, Bronx, Queens, it'll still be in a say a retail, um, high traffic pedestrian, just the same scenarios in all the different boroughs. What about um, whether it's in wealthier neighborhoods compared to non-wealthier neighborhoods or the ethnicities of the neighborhoods? I'm just trying to figure out, sure. you know, do we have more crashes you know, on 140, 140th in Mont Haven in the Bronx as opposed to maybe Park Slope? I don't know. That's right, what I'm right. trying to figure out. Uh, that's not what we found. We didn't find a, a disparity along uh, racial, ethnic uh, income. Um, the priority corridors tend to be in places where there's a lot of pedestrian activity, right? And uh, in a lot of very wealthy areas, there's a lot of pedestrian activity, Manhattan, for instance, uh, and in a lot of uh, less wealthy areas, there's a lot of pedestrian activity. Um, but right, it is, it does have to do with the, and you know, uh, in terms of borough by borough, Manhattan has more of these fatal crashes than other uh, boroughs, that's to be expected because that's where a lot of the work is being done by the industry, uh, but that's that's about it. Yes. And I'm just going to wrap up with last one and a half questions. The industry itself, do you find that they're very cooperative to help and find solutions to the issues of crashes throughout the city of New York? And my final question to you is, if you know something such as drivers being sleep deprived and then they still working, is what can you do to address it quickly and swiftly as a waiting for a crash to happen and say, how do we jump in and correct that situation? So going back to the first question, um, I would say that the industry is critical to this conversation. They are, you know, they're the ones that actually run these businesses. Um, by and large, um, I think we get good cooperation. There could be a lot better cooperation um, by some companies that we sort of never hear from until there's a problem. Um, you know, and another thing with regard to this issue of enforcement, obviously the driver is the one behind the wheel that if something bad happens, he or she was the one, you know, that either hit the bike or ran over the, the pedestrian. But obviously this is a much bigger picture. 
Um, it's not just the driver isolated behind the wheel. It's you know, the way the company is run. Um, you know, how many stops did he or she, were they given that night? What kinds of pressures are they put under? How many hours are they operating? You, so the thing that I'm learning, and again, and this is a completely new area for me, is that what's necessary is really taking a, a much more holistic look at the entire operation. And this is where we really need, you know, the men and women, you know, that are drivers and helpers in the various companies, especially the ones that are really abusing them and creating you know, tremendously unsafe circumstances by the way that they operate their companies to let us know. I'm, am I saying we can fix everything? No. But certainly in the context of having expertise like Vision Zero and advocates and other people, I think we can certainly make a very good effort. And the other half of the question in regards to how quickly you think you can get in if you know something. I heard you say you have, if this is new ground, it's kind of challenging, we need to do right. more work. But if you really know something is happening, if, you know, if, if a company hasn't been communicating with you as much as you need them to communicate, what actions do we take? Because we know something can be wrong and something is obviously going wrong. But how do we t have a preemptive strike well, since someone else doesn't want to step up to you it? You know, we do some, for, for first of all, we have to know about it. And again, there's no way, I would think, unless we get some sort of a tip that we're going to know, let's say, that, that an owner of a company is being particularly onus onerous on his or her drivers. Once we know that, there are things that we can try to do. I mean, it's very fact specific, so I really don't want to try to lay out a hypothetical thing in terms of what we would do, and maybe we wouldn't even be the agency that would do it. I mean, there's the Department of Labor, there are other people involved, but certainly anything on the street with surveillance, we're the ones to do that because we're a law enforcement agency. Well, I thank you for your answering the questions and your testimony today. Have a good holiday. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember King. Councilmember Rose. Thank I just, you. I'm sorry, I just want to acknowledge uh, Councilmember Vanessa Gibson is here as well. Sorry, Councilmember Rose. Sure. Thank you, Chair Reynoso. Um, Director Martinez, uh, there was a disproportional amount of fatalities between the hours of midnight and 6 a.m. Um, uh, for the other fatalities, it was 17 percent, and for the uh, trade waste trucks, it's 31 percent. To what would you attribute that, and um, first, what would you attribute that to? Uh, my, my first assumption is that, from what I understand of the industry, they do a lot of their work at night. It's easier to travel around the city. Uh, it's more convenient for the customer. And so uh, a lot of it has to do with exposure. The vehicles are, are more likely to be on our streets at night. Um, but in general, the disproportionate nature of pedestrian fatalities at night has a lot to do with the fact that speeds increase uh, overnight. Uh, there's less traffic congestion, and uh, there's more potential for drivers to, to go at unsafe speeds. Uh, and visibility, pedestrians uh, are going to be less visible uh, when it's dark out. Would you, um, would you think that um, possibly the, um, the volume, the length of the routes, and the, the limited time span that the private carters actually have to get that work done would attribute to, um, to, would attribute to some of that? If I could take that, I think absolutely. Um, and again, these, these are where the people that work in the industry can best tell us. I mean, the people that have been doing this 5, 10, 15, 20 years, they're the best ones to know the kinds of pressures that are put on them and the kinds of pressures that create unsafe conditions because drivers are just simply too worn out to properly pay attention under the you know, difficult circumstances that driving a big truck at night um, provide. And um, the, the volume, um, by nature of the business, uh, it, it's a lot. Your trucks are about 30 tons, right? And are they sort of, um, do they have to fill them? They have to get all of the con contracted people picked up by 6 a.m., right? Not by law. I mean, I don't, again, that would, that might be, you know, a kind of restriction that, mm -hmm. you know, those managing a business might put on. I don't really know. Would you consider um, putting um, some type of 
um, regulation into your safety plan in terms of the, um, the volume, the length of routes, and, um, and the, you know, in comparison to the time that they have to get that done? You know, and I know it's some years away, but my sense is that that's best handled under a really effective zone collection waste system, that kind of structure. Because one of the things that I'm thinking of, always from the, from the perspective of enforcement, that we may find that out every once in a while, but again, given the small, it isn't only the small nature of, of BIC, how many employees we have, but to be able to catch that I think would be very difficult. My guess is there are better ways to, to sort of legislate that kind of thing, and I think that's really what zone collection is all about. Making, you know, reducing the number of trucks, making them more efficient so that when they go to wherever they're tipping, that they're actually full and you don't have all these companies driving around the city. And also, uh, so member, that they're Council not... Member Rose, could, can you just, a shameless plug here, can you repeat that one more time <laughs> in regards to how we can actually, what your thought was, figure out a way to either to truncate the amount of time that these drivers are on the street um, and also make sure that they don't have 500 businesses right. they have to go to where they exactly. can't even accomplish that. Which contributes uh, to speeding and unsafe practices. Right, and, they, and then the commissioner said that the best way to handle that might not be necessarily through enforcement by BIC, but... Uh, zone, that's, that, that really is the foundation under the zone collection system. One of the main um, things to achieve is a more efficient um, truck routes with trucks getting filled sooner um, and not going to transfer, ta transfer stations until they're actually uh, filled. Now, I'm not saying that's necessarily simple, and, you know, with sanitation really leading the way on this, um, again, with, with all sorts of stakeholders being involved in the conversation, to the extent we all work together collaboratively, even though there are obvious differences of opinion based on what group we're in, I think we can come up with something that, that really works. But it's not going to be simple. But that's the kind of thing I think that addresses your concern. I've also observed um, the private um, carters actually um, engaging in this practice called deadheading, where um, they work both sides of the street, regardless of the flow of traffic. So if the traffic is heading um, eastbound, it's, it's a two-way street, east and westbound, um, the truck might at one point be on the westbound side, but might also be on the eastbound side facing the traffic. Um, and the Department of Sanitation has, um, in their best practices, they've made that an illegal practice. Is this something that Vic would consider adopting for um, your safety plan? Yeah, and the, the first thing I want to say is that when you or any of your constituents or anyone you know sees such a thing, if you tell us that, the thing that we find is, and it's human nature, that if somebody's doing that on one given night, they're probably doing that every time they do those stops. And so that we can be there with our investigators to catch them doing that, and then we can bring appropriate enforcement action. But that's where we really need the public who's out there that's seeing these things, and you don't have to do anything other than call us up. You don't have to take a photo. You don't have to take a video. You don't have to do anything other than saying, you know, I was out here such and such a night. If you get the name of the carter, and usually it's on the side of the truck, that's really helpful with, of course, the location, then that allows our surveillance people to set up and catch them, and then we can photograph them. We can video them, and then we can bring the appropriate enforcement. So it is already something that's regulated, it's just not being enforced. Well, they're, they're breaking the traffic rules, that's something that we can enforce. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for those great questions, Councilmember Rose. There's always space available in the uh, Sanitation Committee, should you ever want to be a part of it. Um, hey, Councilmember Margaret Chin. Uh, thank you, Chair. Well, and thank you to the panel for uh, enlightening us on a uh, bit um, I, one of the, I have a couple of questions. Now, when you mentioned earlier there are 7,800 trucks registered with the big, how many companies, carding companies, are there in New York City? And are they all licensed by the bit? 
So Council Member Chen, there are approximately over 250 licensees and there are roughly over 2,000 companies that have registrations and they haul mostly C and D. What's, what's the difference? 250 and then 2,000. So a licensee can haul any type of trade waste, um, including putrescible trade waste like your regular garbage. Uh, we have two registrations, one for a self-hauler, that's a class one registration. So if you generate your own garbage and you want to haul it yourself, it most frequently happens with landscapers. They, they mow a lawn and they generate lawn clippings and then they haul those themselves. And then there's a class two, which is um, to haul construction and demolition debris only, which is referred to as C and D. Okay, so good to know because if, a cons if one of those company are crushing constructions material in the middle of the night, we called the bid to complain, right? Sure. Okay, that's good to know for my constituents. Um, out of those, are all the company that's, that's doing commercial waste, are they all registered with the bit? I mean, there's no company out there that's not registered? They better be. If they're picking up way, trade waste in the, within the city limits, they better be. We, and we catch companies all the time for doing what's called unlicensed activity, and we issue them a fairly hefty fine. Now, how long is the licensing process? When do they come back for renewal? And the, the question relating to that is that uh, when they're applying for their license or when they're coming back to renew, um, does the commission take into consideration of their, their safety records um, and their, if there have been complaint against them, are those taken into consideration? So it's a two-year cycle, uh, and so they they have to apply to us before they're able to actually begin hauling, but then once they're granted a license or a registration, when it's time for their renewal, they can submit their renewal and they can continue to haul while we consider their renewal application. Um, I'm sorry, what was the So do you take that? into consideration their safety records and complain that's been you know, lodged against them? Do you look, take, do you look at those? We have, they have to disclose their drivers to us and we do a background investigation um, on the company itself and we make sure that the drivers are licensed uh, and they have to obtain a CDL license uh, before they're able to drive. Um, we do not have anything specifically, uh, as, I had, as I said in response to an earlier question, our focus has really has been on the companies and that's the way that our code and rules are structured. The recourse we have against drivers are if there is a particularly uh, dangerous driver who we can find has a um, lacks good character, honesty, and integrity. If it rises to that level, we can take action against the driver by making a finding, and then he would essentially not be employable by the industry. But as of now, that is what that's what we've been doing, and that's one of the reasons that we wanted to talk about. Uh, in, changing our rules or adding, updating our rules, and also speaking with uh, Chair Reynoso about um, amending our code. Yeah, because I think the commissioner mentioned earlier, right, because if, if a company has drivers that have bad driving records or are, you know, involved in accidents, that's also a reflection of the company. And it's like when they come back to renew their license, that's the time where you can institute some changes for them or mandate them to do some safety trainings, right? So it's a highly fact-specific analysis for each one. You have to really look at the size of the company and what percentage of, you know, is if it's a very large company and we're talking about one problematic driver, that's a very different situation than a very small company where maybe the owner is actually also the driver. Um, where that second situation makes it much easier for us, the way our uh, code and rules currently are uh, drafted, to take action against it. But where you have a much larger company and you have, say, a problematic driver, it's a different story for us at this point. Well, I just think that that is a, a tool that we have. You know, when they're coming back to renew their license, that's when we can institute changes or mandate them to do, mm -hmm. you know, safety training. <laughs> I think that's that's a very um, 
important factor to consider when they're coming back to ask for renewals. Right, and the department, obviously the Department of Sanitation doesn't license their own drivers, but Sa Department of Sanitation already has similar measures in place where if a driver or a helper for that matter does or doesn't do th certain things that create a problem, sanitation has really good protocols in place to re-educate people and get them focused on doing things the proper way. And that's one of the reasons why having the Department of Sanitation as part of our safety group has been so valuable. Now also, my, my last question is that, now does the commission work with uh, DOT and the carting companies um, to really proactively look at the, the truck well, how they could be alter um, the street design to make it safer? Because especially like in my district, I represent Lower Manhattan. Uh, Chinatown, Little Italy, the streets are very small, they're narrow, exactly. and then we got different companies, you know, collecting garbage on the same streets. And I am very interested in the, the zoning um, plan to really see how we right. can... Zone collection. Yeah, the zone collection plan to see how we can really uh, improve that, and also to really work with, especially in Manhattan, we have a lot of business improvement district, and they might be able to also give input in terms of um, the zone collection, but also in terms of safety, uh, how they see that their neighborhood could be better served. But in terms of working together, do you have discussion to really proactively look at you know, the problematic streets and try to make it safer? Yeah, one of the things that I neglected to bring up in my testimony, uh, but you reminded me of now, uh, is that we have been, uh, well, we have been working with BIC to ask the companies involved uh, to talk with their drivers and to tell us about problematic intersections and streets, right? Tell us where a turn is particularly difficult and so on, to give us that insight. Because when we do think about vehicular movement, we tend to think about private cars because they're the, the largest number on the street. Uh, and that perspective has been helpful. Um, unsurprisingly, most of the places that they cite as being problematic when you know it's a difficult to make a left turn for instance are the same places that it's tough even in you know my Hyundai Elantra uh, but with that in mind when we do uh, look to revise a truck route we will be taking that feedback in mind as well as uh, from local business groups from council members uh, institutional uh, institutions which take a lot of deliveries, we, we, we put all that together when revising truck routes. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councilmember Chin. Uh, Councilmember Steve Levin, and then we'll head to our panels uh, with our three-minute three minute talking times. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, I apologize if uh, some of the questions that I raised are have been already addressed in this hearing. Um, uh, you know, I represent um, uh, Greenpoint, Brooklyn, um, on Franklin Street. Uh, earlier this year, a young man, um, Natali Ramirez, uh, was was killed by a private sanitation truck um, on his way home from work. Um, and I, I think, uh, obviously, um, his death was preventable. Uh, it was um, a terrible tragedy for him and his family and all that knew him and loved him. Um, how many fatalities, how many, how many, in, how many crashes have occurred uh, in this year, this calendar year, and uh, how is that compared to previous years? Uh, so first, just crashes um, uh, involving a cyclist or pedestrian, and then, um, and then fatalities. So the number that I have immediately available is uh, all fatal crashes. Uh, this year so far there have been seven. Uh, over the past, since 2010, uh, the number tends to range between four and seven in any given year. And that's, that's in total or that's with? Total fatal crashes involving trucks which are registered with BIC, trucks that are similar to those that are registered with BIC. Uh-huh. Um, and, and motorists, motorcyclists, bicyclists, and pedestrians. Right. Um, 
that's obviously an unacceptably high number. Um, and is do you, is it something that you see? What 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 are the major drivers of that? Is it is it vehicle based? Is it is it driver behavior based? Um, and how does that compare to other? How does that compare to DSNY fleets? Mm -hmm. um, so uh, there has not been a Department of Sanitation involved fatality since I believe 2014. Okay. Um, when we look at these crashes, we see that they're a lot like other fatal crashes around the city, uh, except in some cases more so, right? Uh, they, they tend to occur in places which have a lot of severe pedestrian crashes to start with, right? Uh, over 90% are in the areas that we've identified as priority areas that the city needs to work on. DOT is concentrating our projects there, NYPD uh -huh. is concentrating our enforcement in these areas, right? Uh, in addition, turns are a particular concern with these trucks, more so than with private vehicles, and the overnight crashes uh, pop more than they do with ordinary vehicles. So I'm sorry, so just back to the, the, the comparison between private uh, sanitation and, um, and DSNY. What's the size of the fleet of DSNY? I actually couldn't tell you. I don't know. A few thousand? Okay, what's, and what's the size of the private sanitation fleets combined? It's 7,800, over 7,800 trucks registered with BIC. Okay. Um, I think that the DSNY fleet is in the, is probably about two or 3,000, give or take. So if there hasn't been a crash involving a DSNY truck in four years or three years, and um, a fatal uh, crash, and there's a seven annually with a fleet that's about two or three times the size. Um, to me, that speaks to, 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 to driver training and behavior. I can tell you personally, um, you know, I see private sanitation trucks speeding down, you know, uh, quiet residential streets. Um, uh, I see them uh, driving, you know, recklessly. Um, is that, I mean, is that something that, that every New Yorker should, you know, take a, try to take a picture with their cell phone and send it to BIC, send it to 311? If, if they see a driver driving recklessly, how, what are they supposed to do? Absolutely, if they can. They may not have time to. So just giving us a location and the name of the company. So mm -hmm. I live on Upper Broadway, and I'm out at 5 o'clock in the morning walking a dog. Mm -hmm. um, I see trucks going really fast quite often, yeah. um, and then I speak to the drivers. But my point is, for the, for the people out on the street that see things, especially, let's say, backing up into a one-way street going the wrong way, I mean, those are the kinds of things that are really important to let us know, because as I indicated before, if a driver is doing that on one night, my guess is they're probably doing that every time they do that stop. And so, again, I can't say, given how small our size is, that we can be uh -huh. everywhere, but that's the kind of thing that allows us to be much more strategic with the, st with the investigative staff that we have. And what kind of consequences are there? Do drivers get fired for driving recklessly? So, sometimes. I mean, actually, Noah can speak to... I mean, I can tell you that where we get a complaint, we follow up on it. And as just an example, um, on October 30th, we got a complaint about... Um, a driver that somebody felt was driving recklessly and almost hit them and they called they called 311 we got the complaint we called the owner of the company and then we followed up several days later and that driver has been fired but you can't fire the drivers obviously they work for a private sanitation company no and we don't license drivers so what's what, what accountability is there for the companies i mean a, a company has you know can fire or not fire somebody who's driving recklessly is there, are there um protocols within your contracts uh or you know any uh, nexus point with bic to um to ensure that there are i mean are you tracking the number of complaints to the various carters and uh and making you know and and, and looking and seeing how that is to the you know, proportionally to the size of their fleet. And if one, you know, if one company that has 30 trucks has a lot of complaints, I mean, what type of, what type of accountability is there 
in the relationship between BIC and the haulers when it comes to, to driver safety? Well, first of all, I mean, we have we focus a lot on safety in our Tradeways Advisory Board meetings, and so there's a number of companies that are on that board that we speak to directly on a very regular basis about safety. And then we communicate with the entire industry through these safety bulletins. Um, but as of right now, um, we have been focusing on the companies themselves and not specifically the drivers as they, you know, as but what's the stick? Through. So I mean, there's a you know there's a there's these meetings and there's the advisory board and there's the uh, consortia or whatever symposia. What's the um, what's the, what's the consequences to a company if their drivers are consistently um, uh, driving recklessly with these ten ton trucks? So a company that would be operating in the way, and again, as Noah said, it's very fact specific, but a company that's operating where clearly they're in a very reckless um, fashion, I would say that that's certainly a basis to deny a license. Um, again, very fact specific under, you know, lack of good character, honesty, and integrity. Okay, but I mean, like some of the bigger haulers are the ones that I see driving recklessly. I mean, you know, just in my, when I walk up and down the street, you know. Um, I mean, it's what, if, what do you account, I mean, th that, that discrepancy between seven fatality crashes within that fleet, the overall uh, uh, BIC overseen fleet, versus zero a year in uh, DSNY fleet? What do, you, what do you account for that, uh, that wide discrepancy? I mean, I mean, they, to a certain extent, they perform very different jobs. Uh, in terms of with DSNY, they're on uh, regular routes that are picking up very, you know, uh, very regularly along the route, right? They're making multiple stops in a short distance mm -hmm. as opposed to traveling between stops for longer distances. Okay, but, but with that, you know, under that, uh, under that logic, if if uh, a, a DSNY truck was going greater distances between their pickups, they would have the same number of fatalities as, as we're seeing under the private fleets? I guess what I'm trying to get so. at is the, the amount of miles traveled, right, may be significantly different. The time of day that they're operating is also significantly different. It, in the middle of the day, there's more... Uh, there's better visibility and so on, right? Uh, but ultimately, city employees, the city of New York, can uh, put a lot of emphasis on uh, on training, on on discipline, on managing the work schedule, which private enterprise doesn't have to. I put mean, on. okay. I mean, I will suggest that it's you know, with the private fleets, it's like the Wild West, that they feel like they can drive like jerks, without any consequences, you know, you'll, you're lucky if you're able to even see the name of the company, let alone a license plate or a BIC number, and, you know, and it's kind of like, you know, I'll do what I want, and uh, try and catch me. And uh, there seems to be just very little accountability and, you know, real life consequences. You know, people are dying. People are dying. Seven New Yorkers a year lose their life because of, you know, essentially just a devil-may-care cavalier attitude uh, by drivers, and that's and the, the proof is the proof is right there. Um, so you know, I, I you know I don't see the same type of driving even from a sanitation truck that's going you know on their way you know if the sanitation truck is on their way back to the garage. They're not driving you know 40 miles an hour down a residential block, you know? I mean, it's just a different, and so there's, there's got to be some greater consequences. I'd, I'd like to see a, you know, I'd like to see a report that's published. And then based on that report, whoever's got the, you know, the, a disproportionate number of, uh, of complaints or fatalities or crashes, you know, there's got to be some consequences to their, to their contract and to their uh, license. And I'd like to see that. So well, I want to follow up on that. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Levin. Um, just two questions before we get to our next panel. Um, 
we've been updated on the amount of fatalities we've seen over the last two years. What about serious injuries or injuries in general, just crashes in general? Do we have that number? Uh, we don't for a bunch of reasons. Uh, it's just much more difficult to work with that data and to really get down to, reliably get down to what type of truck is involved in those crashes when, it lo when you're looking at the injury data. Okay, so, okay. so in whatever reports you're getting... We, we focused on fatalities because that's easily the, the most comprehensive information we have. But they don't, they don't, so there's no way to know if it's a truck, uh, a, a tradeways we, truck, it's just. Right, right. When we have police reports uh, for the injuries, uh, they, the, the, the specificity about the type of the truck is often very unreliable. Okay. Uh, All right. And, um, and Commissioner, you said you meet with the owners, I guess, of the industry about once a month, you know, trying to get them to do better. Um, are workers involved in those type of meetings at all? No, and I don't want to make it sound like we're meeting with 100 owners. So mm -hmm. it's, a, it's really a small representative group of the owners. Okay. Where we really have more interaction with owners is at these symposia that we have. Um, and I hope you'll be able to make the one in April which will focus on the sort of the latest safety technology uh, for the trucks. But w <clears throat> that's really where we have the most direct interaction and then, you know, various things we do on the website. What about workers? I, I want to know, do you meet with We don't. So one of the frustrations of is, and it's not against the workers and the drivers, is, you know, given their hours, it's very hard to get them you know, and it's reasonable from their perspective at these symposium because, for one thing, they probably just worked all night. So, so that's been one of the frustrations. But that's really the whole emphasis behind trying to have these training videos available so that that can be done, you know, when it works, you know, for the drivers and the helpers. And as I said before, but I don't think I can overstate this, I get that the drivers are the ones behind the wheel that, you know, are involved in the track, the crashes. But it's really the thing that we're looking at is more of a holistic thing because quite often it isn't just the driver that's being a, you know, quote unquote jerk. It's that there's more going on in terms yeah. of the way that company is being managed that has, you know, these screw up, screw ups happen, right. which of course can be catastrophic. So uh, I want to challenge you a little bit there. I just want you to have an open invitation to workers and see if they would show up or not. Um, I think hearing from if their you're perspective. You're there, I bet they'll come. I'm serious. Let's let's try to do something, and you know, you obviously have a keen interest in this. We'll mm -hmm. put it together, and we'll try to set it up at a time that works. All right. So that's very important to me because I think the perspective yeah. of the driver might be helpful in being able to build policy that it, it talks about safety in, a, in an industry that they're very well aware of, and that might not want to be in a public symposium talking about you know their carding company right. is telling them to do 500. Uh, businesses in two hours, but if it was just a, a relationship with you that a more anonymous, I think it would be helpful. So I just want to talk about building that relationship in a more mm -hmm. formal way mm -hmm. so that there is an out for them because uh, no, I, I do be think... critical. There's a right. question that's critical. All right. Thank you. So thank you for your testimony Thanks. here today. I really appreciate it. Um, and we're going to call on the next panel. Uh, the next panel, uh, Carl Orlando, who's a former sanitation worker, um, is going to be here via video. Okay. There's going to be a video there for that. Wilson Perez, make it come up from the Bronx. Sean Campbell from Local 813, Teamsters. And Orette. Orette Ewan. All right, thank you. I know I butchered that. <clears throat> We're going to give a three minute clock on this. Um, just if you hear the buzzer, try to close, uh, get to closing. Um, so is there any particular order? Uh, Sean, so go ahead, um, Sean, you can start, and we'll go from there. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Sean Campbell. I'm the president of Teamsters Local 813 Private Sanitation. Thank you, Sanitation uh, and Transportation Committee Chairs, Reynoso and Rodriguez, for the opportunity to speak before you today. Safety is the biggest issue facing private sanitation workers today, and it is the clearest way to uh, pervasive recklessness in the industry that impacts every New Yorker. The Teamsters believe in Vision Zero, and that is why we support reforming the industry. 
there have been too many tragedies. There was Robert uh, Minahan Jr., a sanitation worker who died when a 10-foot container fell and hit him in the head and torso. Uh, Mr. Ramirez, who was run over and killed as he biked through North Brooklyn this summer. Three-year-old Sophia Aguirre died in the Bronx when her family's car was hit by a garbage truck. Louis uh, was only 18 when he was crushed and killed by a compactor of the truck he was working on. And uh, Mr. Diallo's family is still mourning his death beneath the wheels of a private sanitation truck in the Bronx. I believe these deaths are preventable. The industry needs to begin to take safety seriously. It's not about photo ops and press releases. It's about following the law for uh, truck maintenance, not overworking drivers, and putting lives ahead of profits. You will hear from sanitation workers today about their experiences, but I, what I want to make uh, clear is that these are not isolated stories. These problems are widespread. The truth is that there are more companies doing the wrong thing than doing the right thing. Next time a sanitation company owner says, take care, or they care about safety, ask what the maximum number of hours the drivers are allowed to work in a single shift or a single week. Ask them what the maximum number of stops they give their workers to pick up in the night. Not every company is, is skirting safety. There are some good companies that have regular safety training and maintenance, maintain their trucks, but it's hard for them to compete with the cheap carters who are cutting every corner. That's why Mayor de Blasio's commercial waste zoning policy is important. We will finally have reasonable routes, we will finally have safety standards, and we will finally have accountability. So carters have to follow the rules or risk losing their contract. You have our full support in finally bringing a culture of safety to the private sanitation uh, industry. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Sean. Uh, we're going to go with Wilson Perez next. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Wilson Perez. I'm a private sanitation worker. Until recently, I worked at Queens County Carding. This is an industry that doesn't care about safety. The trucks aren't safe and what the bosses make us do is unsafe. I will come in to work at 6 a.m. each day, my shift lasting until 6 p.m. I was exhausted. But then I would get a call from the boss telling me I had to go to work the night shift. I had to be at my location working at 8 p.m. I wouldn't be done until 1 a.m. or even 3 a.m. Then I will have to be back at work at 6 a.m. for the next shift. Would you like um, a wonderful driver who is overworked driving a garbage truck past your kid's school? Me neither. But it happens every day in the industry. I will complain to the owners, Anthony and Mike, but the response would be, I could work or go home. And I, know, I knew going home meant I was fired. I would drink a lot of coffee to try to stay awake. 10 or even 11 cups at night. I thank God I never drifted off and hit someone. I was so scared that would happen. One time I was picking up containers of concrete from the construction site. The truck I was driving was only supposed to take 35 containers. Any more would be unsafe. The customer wanted me to take 60. I said no, that was not safe. Then I got called from the boss telling me to do, do it anyway. They don't care about having safe trucks neither. One day I came to work and started driving and found the truck I wouldn't stay in second gear. It kept popping out. I reported it, but the boss Anthony told me just to shift directly from first gear to third gear. How as crazy as that? The same truck, the driver's door would stay, would not, wouldn't stay shut. I had to hold onto the door whenever I made a turn so it would open fly, fly open. Finally, I told them I would rather be fired than drive that truck again. Only then did they fix it. Another truck had bad brakes that never got fixed. I remember once I was driving on the Upper East Side when the brakes went out. I was approaching the red light and then there was a woman crossing through the intersection. The truck went right through the intersection. Thank God I didn't hit her. Another time, I started smelling smoke in the cab of my truck. 
Some wires had started burning. The company sent the mechanic out to meet me, who made some fix, and then I went, was sent right back to work on that truck. When I started Queens County, they would pay me 40 hours a week on the books. Then the rest of the hours would be off the books. I wouldn't get any overtime or time and a half. They had me working completely off the books. There was one point when I had hope things would get better. One of my coworkers started talking about getting the union teachers local one on 813, but then the bosses called in for a meeting. They had heard we were talking about the union, and if, and if any of us talked about it, again, we'll be fired. That was the end of that. All us workers, we knew what was going on was illegal. But it doesn't feel like there is anywhere that private sanitation workers can go to to get help in the city. We aren't the only ones who are in danger. It is everyone else walking or biking or driving the city too. You can say no to your boss, but they will find someone else to drive the trucks. Thank you for listening to me. I hope you can do something to make private sanitation a safe industry. Thank you, Wilson. All right. Hello, my name is Oret Ewan. I work for a carding company in the Bronx, Sanitation Salvage. I worked there for nine years, nine and a half years. <clears throat> There's a lot of things that's done in, the, in that company that's illegal. <clears throat> they let us work 18, sometimes 17 to 18 hours. <clears throat> and if you complain, they will terminate you. I, some days I work, I'm there, I don't even know how I get to the next stop because I'm asleep. I'm working every day. It bothers just talking about it. So, you know, and, and it's a lot of things. You walk, the, you, write, you write up things. The steps are broken. They take weeks. You complain, you complain. They don't do nothing. The brakes one day, we was on a hill. He put the, the driver put the brakes. It rolled down. The, dr the truck rolled down. Lucky thing, the driver. One day, the driver drove off. He didn't even realize where he was going. I'm shaking the truck for him to stop because he's asleep in the truck. There's a lot of things that's being done in these companies that's really, really unfair to, to anybody. And you, you got a, too much work. They don't want to pay. They don't want to do nothing for you. I don't even know how to explain it no more because it's, it's hard even thinking about it. And it's... It's a disgrace that we're getting treated this way for people that we're working for, that we're helping, you know? And we're there to help our family too, but they don't understand it. All they worry about is the cash, and it's unfair to us, all around the board, to, for everybody. Mainly in the company that I'm, I'm speaking for, I'm speaking because I'm against all the stuff that they're doing to the workers, you know? And I don't know, that's... Thank you for your testimony. I want you to know that in the last four years since I've been chair of this committee, all I've been doing is really trying to focus on worker safety and to give you a voice, to allow you to be here um, and testify, and that hopefully in the next, you know, two, three years, your stories are different, right, that we've actually made progress. We now have BIC, which is the Business Integrity Commission, interested in being an overseer of safety, the way TLC, you saw that video, it would be great for every driver to see that video, for the companies to be held accountable to make sure that that happens. Hours that are more reasonable, where you don't feel threatened or you don't feel like you would lose your job. Um, and I'm hearing your stories and it, and it is scary uh, out there. And I just wish that the owners would see you more as partners uh, in trying to do the right thing as opposed to just expendable workers, which it seems like um, at times with the testimonies that I get, um, it is what it sounds like. Um, there's a lot of, uh, I want to say, uh, dog and pony show that is put together right now by the industry with these safety symposiums that are, you know, the second annual safety symposium um, that really speaks to a crisis when you're, they're now looking to self-police in safety, but we're looking to do it legislatively, so it's across the board this way. We've been working with 813, um, the local 813 recently, uh, to really try to get a hold on this. And for them, they're not even looking out for just their union members. They're saying, we just need safety across the board. People are dying. Things are unsafe. 
So I just want you to know that your testimony here is not for nothing, that we are looking to improve, and that hopefully in two to three years we're talking about a victory about in bringing this industry to a place where we can be proud of it as opposed to where it is right now. And we know it's, it's a mess right now, and that's why we're having this, this hearing here, and we've had other hearings on it as well. But I really appreciate your, your testimony today. Um, Sean, I know that you've you talked about wanting to be on an advisory board. It makes no sense how the workers are not on an advisory board about safety when they know firsthand the concerns that they have regarding you know, having to switch from first to third gear um, because the second gear doesn't work, a door is opening, no brakes um, in the city of New York, uh, and the, the, the troubling inspections of these trucks that are not, are, are not happening. But I'm going to follow up with all this testimony that's happening today, and hopefully we see, we see some change. And I want it to happen as soon as possible. So just know that I'm going to be there working um, on your behalf to get this industry to a place where it's safe. But thank you for your testimony. I really appreciate it. I know we have one more testimony uh, by a Carl, uh, Carl Orlando that's going to happen um, here. So go ahead. I hope there's volume. Okay. Okay, I think that speaks for itself. Um, I do want to get to a place where we have more, uh, a more clear direction as to where drivers can go when there's something bad happening and that somebody would be held accountable. At this point, it's like, is every man for themselves? There's no clear path of if this happens, who do I talk to? Some is BIC, some is sanitation, some is DCA, some is OSHA. It's just like 10 agencies, who knows who to call? I'm going to try to really figure out a way to start building a system that allows for drivers to know there's like one number, one agency that they can call that can handle all issues, and they always know that that, that number or that agency is going to direct them to the right location and it could be handled. So um, this, is, this is unfortunate, but um, it's going to help us get to, the, to an answer. But I really want to thank you for your testimony, and it's, it takes a lot of heart and bravery to be here. And so long as you're here testifying, I'm always going to be here protecting you guys and making sure you're doing right. We do right by you. So thank you. Thank you, Sean. Thank you. Ben Weinstein, scene. Uh, Steve Vaccaro is he here. Steve Vaccaro, yes. Mark O'Connor. Steve Shanagaris and Kendall Christensen.
Steve, you want to go ahead and start? Sure. Thanks very much, Thank uh, you. Council Member Reynoso, to uh, uh, the other committee chair, Idanis Rodriguez, and the members of the committee for holding this oversight hearing. I'm a founding member and of the Board of Streets PAC, the political action committee that supports elected officials who are um, trying to make New York City streets more safe and livable. I'm also an attorney representing crash victims, uh, including the families of a number of individuals who've been seriously injured or killed um, in traffic collisions with private carting vehicles over the years. One of those is Hoyt Jacobs, um, a 37-year-old uh, professor at CUNY who was killed by a private carting truck uh, driver um, on January 17, 2015. Um, at the time of the collision, uh, oh, that truck was owned by Manhattan Demolition. Um, the truck was making an unsignaled right turn across a bicycle path at night. Uh, Mr. Jacobs was bicycling in a marked bicycle lane uh, with lights on his vehicles. He was struck and crushed by the truck. The roadway that the truck driver was turning onto, 41st Avenue in that vicinity, was not a truck route, and the driver was not on his way specifically to a pickup or drop-off, but rather on his way, according to his testimony in the civil litigation, to pick up um, a, a meal for that evening. So. Um, this was an overtime shift, in fact, that the truck driver was on. And when we got to the civil litigation, it became clear that there was no record keeping whatsoever of the driver's hours. It became clear that the driver did not have a clear record of what the truck routes were in the city and that there was no proper training in the use of crossover mirrors and parabolic mirrors. Um, these are things that one would expect to be standard. These trucks have, um, are known to have problematic sight lines. They're heavy, they're oversized, they go all over the city to do their work. They're a necessary part of, of making New York City um, continue to grow economically, but there needs to be regulation. If there's some thought that the Federal Department of Transportation is going to fulfill this role because most of these trucks are regulated by the federal DOT, you should forget about it. Even under the Obama administration, we find that there were audits every three years where private carting companies such as Manhattan Demolition and Imperium Construction could fail the safety component of these federal DOT um, audits and nonetheless go forward and continue not to keep drivers hours, not to keep daily safety checks on the vehicles, not to train drivers in the use of the parabolic or spot mirrors or of the crossover mirrors, which is essential for the drivers to know when there is a cyclist or a pedestrian who may be nearby the truck. So I would just urge that um, the City Council continue to stay the course, the right-of-way law, which uh, there have been some efforts to try to limit its applicability to professional drivers is one of the most important regulations that we should have and preserve. Secondly, every driver should be required and, and every owner of one of these trucks should be required to keep a map showing all the truck routes right in the cab there with the driver to be able to consult. Both the drivers and the police are not fully familiar with which and which are not truck routes and when they can or cannot use them. And thirdly, I think we've been studying the problem from what I heard from the administration for several years and we still haven't gotten these regulations or these training steps in place. It's about time. There are some things we know could be done right now that could save lives and I urge the committee to work with their partners in the uh, administration to get some of this done. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Just uh, a heads up, we, we are working with uh, the Commissioner of Sanitation, uh, Captain Garcia, um, to push the this, uh, waste zones or uh, waste zones that would allow us to insert safety measures through RFPs in a way that we can't do it through, through um, I'm sorry, uh, no, no, uh, through per, uh, permits, I guess, or increasing capacity, for example. So right now we give them permits uh, we are not allowed to use that in, um, uh, to, to leverage safety and so forth. But in RFP, if you have a bad track record or you haven't been doing things the right way, that can be held against you in an RFP. Um, and we're looking to you know, empower the organizations that do a good job and really stop empowering the folks that are not not doing a good job uh, and giving them these contracts. So we're hoping that that does help. But I did want to get your take very quickly before I move on. Um, BIC being, so right now, for example, no record keeping of hours by employees 
is beyond me. I thought that was like a law that was passed universally in like the 1980s or something. Uh, um, I didn't even, I didn't know that or hear that, but the reason there's no record keeping is because there's probably no one that they have to send that to or that's asking that to be sent to them. You said the truck route situation, whether or not they know where the truck route is, um, and whether or not they have these mirrors or they're using these mirrors, I don't know how you can necessarily know that outside of a video camera in a truck possibly. Um, but just the no record keeping portion of it. Is there a law right now, and you are a lawyer, can you just give a little bit of background about who you are and why these questions might, re might be relevant to you, uh, but really speaking on the record keeping situation, why is that not a law that, or what agency is supposed to take that information on, and are they not doing it, or do we just not have that? Well, um, under um, Part 395 of the relevant uh, Code of Federal Regulations, federal. Um, the federal DOT requires um, there to be hours uh, logs kept by drivers in order to know how many hours they're working, and there are pretty strict limits, no more than 12 consecutive hours in a day, no more than 60 consecutive hours or 60 hours in a week. And what we find is that the companies that I'm familiar with, that through civil litigation, after one of these crashes occur, we go to the companies, and either they don't know anything about it or they say, oh, well, that's the driver's responsibility. The driver's supposed to be keeping his own or her own hours. And that doesn't make any sense at all because it's the employers who send the drivers out onto the street to do the work. It was not great under the Obama administration. Now we have a Republican administration in Washington that thinks regulation is a dirty word. Mm -hmm. So we can't expect to fall back on the federal DOT to enforce these hours regulations under um, 49 CFR section 395. This should be, and, and frankly, the state isn't going to do it either. The state incorporates these regulations, mm -hmm. but I don't think that the state DOT is attuned to the pedestrian rich environment of New York City where there are cyclists and pedestrians who can, you know, get caught up in these, in these traffic crashes. So this is a uniquely city issue. These vulnerable street users around these carting trucks that need to go virtually everywhere in order to do their job. And so w this is why there's, there's a, a lack of coordination and, it, and the buck stops, I guess, with the city council and the city administration. I agree 100 percent. And we will be doing something very shortly to see if we can improve improve this and see if there's any opportunities for oversight and just accountability in general. So we are working on that. And that's what this hearing is about, is to finally figure out what we can do. And I think um, we had some members here that are really excited about, about that happening. Thank you. Um, thank you, Steve. Next. Hi. Thank you for having me, Councilman Reynoso. My name is Ben Weinstein. I'm from Clean Up North Brooklyn. We're an organization fighting for cleaner air quality uh, in North Brooklyn and citywide. Um, <clears throat> the dangers of private carting are most prevalent in neighborhoods with waste transfer stations. Truck drivers blow stop signs with regularity and take the shortest route possible. That means squeezing down narrow streets lined with four-story apartment buildings. These small streets are not designated as truck routes, but to maximize profits, private carters disregard the safety of our communities by taking the faster, more profitable shortcut. In addition, long-haul tractor trailers drive on sidewalks daily and go the wrong way on one-way streets with impunity. In a single week, our community organization witnessed 91 blown stop signs, 22 in instances of 18-wheelers going the wrong way, 118 times they drove on sidewalks, and 250 truck route violations. This is not to mention over 60 idling violations, all by private carters. As a community, we understand the important service these companies are doing for New York. It doesn't mean they can break basic traffic and air quality regulations meant to protect our families. The dangerous driving practices of private carters compounds an already heavy burden of diesel fumes, stench, noise pollution on three communities in particular, the South Bronx, Southwest Queens, and North Brooklyn. One parent in North Brooklyn, Sanders, Sanders Mendez, gave us a quote. He said, the garbage trucks often sit in front of our church on Porter Avenue and they idle. They stink and drip liquid onto the street. At the stop sign in our corner, they rarely ever come to a stop. They just roll through. I have to talk to my three children almost every day about it. I say, look very carefully both ways and look out for garbage trucks. It gives me a lot of anxiety. And the sad thing is that we've come to accept it as normal. 
we've become accustomed to the unfair actions of these companies. It's because we feel like we don't have much say in the matter. Hopefully more people will speak up about it because it affects our way of life. If we can be united and say something, maybe we can do something about it. Sanders Mendez is part of a growing movement of families that are standing up to private carting and privately owned waste transfer stations. As the city moves towards urban sustainability, these private carters must be held accountable to stop at every stop sign, obey every traffic and idling law. Sustainability is not only about lowering emissions in the future, it's about mitigating the current environmental burden on communities caught in harm's way of private carting. If they're not willing to follow basic regulation, private carters will continue to be called out for putting profits before safety. Thank you. And as you know, we're pushing intro 495. Um, that should be able to reduce truck traffic, especially in North Brooklyn, which I'm excited that I'm looking to push. Just want you to know that uh, a lot of times North Brooklyn is used as a bargaining chip uh, to help other communities that are not as enthusiastic as we are to, to reduce truck traffic and see environmental justice. And in doing so, we'll delay justice in North Brooklyn for coming years. Um, and that I just really want uh, Clean Up North Brooklyn to play a, a strong voice in ensuring that we get justice for North Brooklyn as soon as possible um, in pushing intro 495, okay? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Committee Chair Reynoso, for convening this uh, hearing. My name is Mark O'Connor. I'm the Legislative and Legal Director with Transportation Alternatives. As you know, for 44 years, Transportation Alternatives has advocated on behalf of New Yorkers for safer and more livable streets. Um, today, large vehicles, including waste hauling trucks, account for a disproportionate portion of traffic deaths and injuries. They account for 6% of vehicles on our streets, yet they are involved in approximately 20% of crashes where pedestrians are killed or severely injured. Crashes involving commercial trucks are three times more likely to result in pedestrian fatalities than passenger vehicles. Safety and preventing injury and loss of life must be the sole overarching priority for our city. To help make commercial waste hauling safe for all road users in New York City, the following steps must be taken. One, contracts must be tied to safety performance. In a recent two-year period, 96% of all safety violations identified in inspections of New York City's largest carters concerned vehicle maintenance, including faulty brakes, faulty tires, and lights. Companies with high rates or frequencies of involvement in crashes causing injury or death should not be allowed to do business in New York City. Two, the industry must adopt next generation safe vehicle design, technology, and transparency measures. The Department of Sanitation and BIG must lead the adoption of next generation safe vehicle design and technology and incentivize their wider adoption by private waste hauling fleets. Sideguards is only the first steps in this process. We recommend the city, uh, and BIC in particular, uh, work with the New York City Taxi and Limousine Commission to learn from their driver accountability measures and the driver monitoring safety technology recently piloted by the TLC. This technology should also be used to increase transparency to allow public insight into the safety and violation history of waste hauling companies. Three, professional drivers must be held to the highest standard the city must require intensive and ongoing driver education safety training and individual drivers with high rates of crash involvement or dangerous driving should not be allowed to drive commercially in New York City. New legislation may be required to give big, this enforcement power. Finally, implementation of exclusive commercial waste collection zones must be expedited by the city in order to reduce gross mileage covered by trucks which lowers the exposure to other road users, especially vulnerable pedestrians and bicyclists. The city estimates that total waste carting mileage can be reduced by 49 to 68% from implementing commercial waste collection zones. Um, Chairman, these are measures necessary for the private waste hauling industry to correct years of unacceptably high 
injury and fatality rates by its trucks. And with the city and this council exercising your public health mandate um, to protect New Yorkers, lives can be saved and our city's waste hauling industry can be a model to follow. Thank you. Thank you. And just uh, regarding the four, the, la the commercial waste collection zones should be able to help with the first issue, which is contracts must be tied to safety for performance. Again, uh, currently the contracts we have can't be tied to that. Um, so we're trying to figure out a way through an RFP system to be able to do that. Um, the safety design technology situation, uh, a previous council thought 2024 would be a good time to make that happen, um, which is six years from even today. Uh, and I don't understand what logic that, that made, giving the industry more than 10 years to figure out a way to get their stuff together. I just think that's a long time. Um, and given the crisis in vehicle safeties, in vehicle safety and pedestrian safety issues we have now, um, I think because of Vision Zero, we should relook at that legislation to see if we can do that for earlier than 2024, maybe align it with Vision Zero and make it 2020. Um, so, and the drivers must be held to the highest standard. Um, I agree, I just think that right now, uh, we're asking so little of the industry that they in turn are asking so little of their drivers. Um, I think the drivers want to be professionalized, want to have higher standards, want to be treated with more dignity and respect and so forth. But so long as we continue to treat uh, the private trash industry like trash, it's gonna continue. So really uh, appreciate your four recommendations. And they're definitely things that we're looking into and are aligned with. So thank you for that testimony. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my name is Steve Changaris, members of the committee, uh, staff. Uh, I work with the National Waste and Recycling Association. We work with the private uh, carting companies in the city, the waste and recyclers uh, that collect the commercial waste. Uh, thank you for having this hearing. Uh, it's been mentioned uh, that we uh, collect a lot of material in the city today, about, according to the DSNY numbers, about uh, 3.5 million uh, tons, and that based on DSNY uh, uh, studies, we go about 20 million uh, route miles annually managing this material. Um, my comments are written uh, and on the record. Uh, I'm going to just walk through them in a conversational way to try to meet the time frame. Um, we identify that the refuse and recyclable material collector is the fifth most dangerous occupation on the Bureau of Labor Statistics um, a fatal uh, census, annual census. Uh, we want off that list, and as an industry and as a trade association, uh, we're working to get off that top 10 list. Uh, we've adopted a zero fatality value and a corresponding challenge to reduce all ac accidents and, uh, and, and run uh, our companies more safely. Uh, the idea of safety being a core value, values don't change, priorities do, uh, is infiltrating the industry and uh, it's more than lip service. As a 25 year veteran of the association, I can say that safety is more and more on the minds of the industry as we go forward to service our customers. Uh, we've created a safety sharing uh, culture and a value as well. As you could see the commissioner this morning, uh, we've been working, um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later, extensively with the BIC and the DSNY to try to improve safety um, for all concerned. Um, you know, we're a, a very regulated industry, despite of what's been said today. Um, we often think of it in the scope of environmental companies, but today we're here obviously as truckers because we're collecting all the city's wastes and recyclables. Um, all of our uh, operators are regulated on the fate and st uh, uh, federal DOT. They all have CDLs. The CDLs prescribe minimum standards uh, for uh, our drivers, and they also uh, uh, state disqualifications for drivers. So, uh, and then we're also regulated by a bunch of other uh, um, companies. Companies that violate the rules and regulations, we believe, should be uh, enforced and appropriate action taken. Um, the um, work with BIC has been noted and the DSNY. Um, specifically, m the leading companies, the members of the association have worked very closely with BIC in providing their time and talent, their expertise, their safety personnel to make those safety symposia a, a good events. We're looking forward to the next one in, in, in uh, April and we're looking forward to raising the bar uh, there. Uh, the association in our work, we've volunteered and surrendered a copy of our manual of best recommended safety practices as well as our online safety video for drivers. So we're hoping and working with, the, with them to, to put them into play. Um, may I go on? 
Okay. Uh, as far as safety technology is concerned, it's another great thing that's come out of these seminars. We have a new safety technology in the industry that uses video cameras and onboard data recorders, computer modules, and they record all the events surrounding the truck, the driver behavior, uh, other uh, road conditions, other vehicles, pedestrians, and these, um, t this tool uh, has been adopted by a lot of the members and is in being more widespread in the industry. They create a, an actionable record that we can discern what happened and we can use to train. I think this passionate word is root cause analysis and they really lead to that, that we want to get to the bottom of why an accident happened and then um, go forward so they don't happen again. Um, um, the um, idea that um, you know, our drivers and our helpers are in a very high fatality industry. We want to get them off that. It's a safety collaboration. We worked hard to get the slowdown to get around law passed. So we encourage, uh, as we work with distra on distracted driving, we hope people and pedestrians, bikers, uh, try to remain as distracted less as possible. And we also encourage the use of safe, on, on the train in today, I, I went up and I chatted with a fellow with his green iridescent helmet and bike pack, a biker and a bicyclist. And I said, you know, you know, here in my testimony, we're talking about you because we think if this can all help to get uh, this, uh, s these situations resolved. Safety is a key component in our business. It's everybody's business to try to um, um, be safe and we can move the needle. So Just it's a dialogue, so it's collaborative, and we yeah. appreciate uh, the opportunity to be here. And look, we, we want to be as collaborative with the industry as possible, but it seems like only when legislation is introduced do they ever step up, right? Like self-policing is non-existent in the industry. Again, the safety symposium started two years um, and it was after we initiated conversations about the issues of safety. Um, there was a, a misnomer. I was the boy who cried wolf about uh, the amount of travels, uh, vehicle mi vehicles miled, miles traveled uh, by this industry as well was an issue. That it, it was the most efficient routes in the, in the world is how they, they would put it. And then we find that we can actually improve it by more than 50% conservative, conservatively. Right? So I just really feel like this industry is one where it works much better with sticks than it does with carrots. Um, and I'm, I'm going to continue to do my part to put, impose legislation um, that I think would actually solve a lot of these problems because I haven't seen an industry that's been able to self-regulate. Um, while there are some uh, good characters at the top that are trying to make changes, uh, the big commissioner himself has said that those symposiums are not well attended to the degree that he would like um, when it comes to a, a widespread um, industry practice or industry um, uh, enthusiasm. So again, I just want to make sure you know we're not trying to make you the bad guy, but it's very easy to do that because it, the mistakes are just like tenfold. Every time I have a hearing, the testimony you hear from, th do, you, do you think that they're lying when they talk about having a shift from first to third gear? Do you think that they're lying when they say that they have faulty brakes? You know, the, the testimony regarding somebody be having to take off their shirt those are just not things that I think people are going to make up for the sake of making them up. I really do think that they're concerned about their safety and that this industry does everything it can to work against that. So, so long as that continues to happen and you don't have widespread representation or support from the entire industry, I'm going to have to continue to look to impose legislation to protect workers, to protect drivers, helpers, and pedestrians and bikers alike. We're anxious to assist any way we can in raising the safety bar. I'm, I'm looking forward to you writing a letter of support for legislation regarding safety um, uh, that we are going to push put forward. Um, that would be a, a, a dream that the industry actually in, in, supports legislation that is going to improve safety instead of fight it. Um, so I'm looking forward to that day. To remind the, um, Mr. Chairman, we did support the bike guard legislation when when it when it passed so which one the the bicycle side guard the bicycle legislation and, slow down to get around. and and the slow down to get around as well so the the bike guard bicycle side guard you're talking about the side guard one the yeah. 20 the one that you got to put in by 2024 anyone would support that by 2024 we could have spaceships uh, carrying carrying garbage it's 2024 you guys had to be more stringent with your own legislation that you would support and and I guarantee I want to tell you the 2024 number came from you it was the industry that, would, that pushed it back, right? It was, the, I, I guarantee right now that the, 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 the legislator that wanted to put forth legislation to include side guards had to put 2024 because they got pushed back from the industry that they won't be able to convert it fast enough. The legislation that we need to get trucks that are only at, I think, is the levels of 20, what is it, 20, 2007. 2007 vehicles, 
that, that takes 10 years to do, and we got to wait till 2017 and see that conversion. Also industry. Those are two things that could have improved safety significantly if they would have both been put in a more timely fashion. The five years maybe for getting new vehicles, and, and five years maybe for getting the side guards. But they're both taking too long. And that's what I'm saying. We need to just be more bold about implementing safety, um, safety um, in these trucks. And I think that a lot of people will change their mind about an industry that we think is like the wild, wild west, even, you would, even though you would disagree. And also the Federal Department of Transportation. I'm going to have conversations with the small business chair, Nadia Velasquez, regarding what she can do to be helpful with the um, DOT situation. But uh, Donald Trump is the president. So we're going to be extremely limited as to what regulations we can now Impose, but I guarantee the federal DOT folks are not coming down to New York City um, and inspecting all these trucks to see what's wrong with them. And if they do do that, I would love to see what the statistics they would come out of in regards to um, the standard or, or, or the level of, of maintenance that these trucks do have. Kendall? Good afternoon, Chairman Renoso. Am I the last? Good. Well, at the risk of adding... You're not last uh, overall, but you're one at of the, them. At the last of uh, adding to your dog and pony show on behalf of the industry, um, <laughs> I too submitted a written statement for the record, and I'll uh, just make a few brief comments based uh, on please. the testimony earlier today. Uh, first of all, uh, I want to be clear, as I think C was as well, is that we all support the city's uh, Vision Zero goals and want them to be more than aspirational but uh, actually achievable. Uh, we all share that concern uh, and are working uh, daily to, uh, to address it. Uh, I want to be, uh, uh, go back over a couple of data points because there's a lot of data thrown out this morning um, about trucks, BIC licensed trucks, and private sanitation trucks. There are three different things. Um, our industry estimates is that there are about 800 private sanitation trucks on the street every night. Um, BIC mentioned they uh, license 7,800 7, trucks, but those are a wide range of trucks that they regulate and license. So we want to be clear about what we're talking about. Uh, the city's uh, analysis uh, leading to their uh, uh, announced intention to pursue franchising found that there are essentially 90 companies uh, currently providing uh, waste management collection services in the city uh, and that found that about uh, 20 of those uh, provide about 80 percent of the industry's service. Uh, so there's already considerable consolidation in the industry. Not many small players left. It's mostly uh, larger and mid and large size companies that uh, dominate this industry, are more professionally run, uh, are uh, more active in their engagement with, the, uh, with BIC and with the safety symposia and those kinds of things as well. So I think it's important to really sort of, if you want to sort of narrow in on the companies that Steve and I represent, it's a subset of what uh, was been talked about uh, this morning. Even in DOT's testimony about accidents related to commercial trucks on the street, only a, a tiny fraction of those are related to uh, pr uh, private sanitation trucks. Um, the other comment I want to make uh, is uh, to your question about what the value of the safety symposiums has been. Um, and I recently, uh, literally last week, uh, surveyed uh, my member companies about uh, how their safety practices have changed over the last year and uh, to what extent those were uh, the result of uh, lessons learned and, and the like from the safety symposia. And I was uh, really impressed by the uh, answers. I'll be sharing this with the BIC Trade Waste Advisory Board uh, meeting in a few weeks. Um, but what I found from that uh, um, is uh, I got eight immediate responses. Let me see if I can just find my summary of them here. Um, Companies reported aggressive fleet replacement with side guards and as many as seven onboard cameras, more frequent and focused safety training, use of new tools, including several of them have now showed TLC's video to their drivers, uh, online and in-person training, and daily attention focus on the basics, proper PPE and pre-route inspections, et cetera. Um, so I think you know, we, these events happen, as you said. Uh, they can be dog and pony shows. Uh, but um, uh, my, uh, my, my query here to them, again, was to try and evaluate what the impact has been, and I think already that has uh, had a significant uh, impact on their operations alike. I'll conclude with that and look forward to continuing the dialogue with you, members of the council, and other advocates uh, in the room today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ken. And if we could get just some recommendations from that, that safety symposium, legislative recommendations to our office. I, I, um, I'm sorry. Legislative recommendations from those safety symposiums would be, would be a, great, a great look for, for the industry. 
um, again, that, that self-policing might not work for everyone and that your good companies are being, you know, well, they're you being know, destroyed uh, character-wise by the bad companies. So maybe legislation that will hold you all to the same standard could be very helpful. Well, there may be legislation, maybe more regulations that could be helpful. Interestingly, looking at uh, LA's experience in implementing their franchise system, their contracts, well, first of all, uh, safety was not a top ten driver uh, of uh, franchising in Los Angeles. It doesn't appear in any of their uh, uh, documents as an issue of, uh, pr of concern. It doesn't really show up in their contracts as, a, as an issue of concern. They require that companies, uh, the seven that now have franchise agreements in LA, have comprehensive and you know state-of-the-art safety programs, but there's no extraordinary regulatory regime for it. Uh, those uh, programs are subject to audit, uh, at, you know, by the city whenever. Uh, but it's interesting to look at that, and I, I do a lot of work in other cities as well. And uh, I know that safety is always a concern of this industry. But uh, my sense of it is that New York is light years ahead of most of them in paying this level of attention to safety as a as an issue, including uh, the Vision Zero framework in which we're uh, discussing it. Yeah, I agree with that. I do. Uh, thank you to this panel for your time. And we have one last panel before we head out. Uh, Priya, Sarah. Annabelle and Justin. It's the last panel. The, the, save the best for last, hopefully. Good afternoon, and thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Priya Mulgaukar, and I'm here on behalf of the New York City Environmental Justice Alliance. Founded in 1991, NIJA is a nonprofit citywide membership network linking grassroots organizations from low income communities and communities of color in their struggle for environmental justice. NIJA has empowered its member organizations to advocate for a safer, more equitable, and sustainable solid waste management system for over 25 years. Roughly 75% of the city's waste is processed in just a handful of low-income communities and communities of color where truck-dependent transfer stations are clustered. As such, we advocate for strong policies that minimize the impact of truck traffic in our neighborhoods, which poses serious health and safety risks to our members. NIJA is per particularly concerned about the private sanitation industry, whose record on safety with respect to workers and community is concerning. While DSNY has taken steps to improve their collection fleet in terms of safety, public health, and environmental impacts, private carding companies, which handle about two-thirds of the waste stream, have made little investment in ensuring that their labor practices and equipment are operating at the highest safety standards. Lack of investment in this fleet safety in fleet safety reflects just one aspect of a systemic issue. The commercial waste industry as it currently operates receives little incentive and oversight to make forward-thinking investments in the health and safety of the communities that they employ and in which they operate. In 2016, along with our partners in the Transform Don't Trash Coalition, NIJA released a report that assessed the overconcentration of truck traffic in communities in the South Bronx, North Brooklyn, and South Brooklyn. Our volunteers counted waste trucks and collected data on particulate matter associated with diesel exhaust. To offer just one example, volunteers in the South Bronx at a particularly bad street corner counted 304 commercial trucks per hour, almost half of which were commercial waste trucks, which amounts to one commercial waste truck every 24 seconds. Similarly, North Brooklyn recorded up to 203 trucks per hour on weekdays, with an average of a third being commercial waste trucks. As the city moves forward with its new zoned system for commercial waste, steps must be taken to advance the long-awaited shift from an unjust, polluting, truck-based system to a safer, cleaner, and fairer system that truly holds carters accountable to the communities in which they operate. Communities burdened by the proximity and concentration of commercial waste trucks need concrete action to ensure that the fleet is properly serviced and safe. 
DSNY and BIC should consider using a high standard RFP process for its commercial waste zones, whereby contracts are awarded to haulers with the strongest proposals for vehicle safety and reduction of ne negative community impacts. Routing efficiency and more equitable distribution of waste transfer stations and hauling across the city can also increase safety and public health for environmental justice communities. Additionally, actions to improve safety of the commercial sanitation fleet must also address the public health ha hazards of diesel pollution. Local Law 145 requires that commercial carters comply with 2007 EPA emission standards for diesel trucks by 2019. The City Council should hold an oversight hearing and work with DSNY to track the industry's progress with compliance of Local Law 145 and ensure that commercial waste zone, the commercial waste zone process updates and provides additional enforcement for emission standards. Thank you again for this opportunity to testify. Thank you. And I got it wrong. It wasn't 2017. It was 2019 that we have to wait for these trucks to be updated. Oh, wow. Thank you for that. Hi, I'm Sarah Lilly. Um, I'm just uh, I'm just a neighbor in North Brooklyn. I actually, uh, Councilman Reynoso, you are my councilman. I'm very grateful that you're here, bringing a lot of uh, light to this issue. Um, I've been in North Brooklyn for 21 years. I moderate a, a Facebook group of about 5,000 um, very uh, active members from the community, mainly in Greenpoint and uh, Williamsburg. And I'm also a, a pedestrian, a cyclist, and I have a car. So I've seen, I see all angles of this in North Brooklyn. You're like, you're like a walking contradiction. What's I know. going on? You can't do it all. I know. Got to pick a side. <laughs> so um, one thing that that strikes me in all this is just the, the sense um, that this is about profit. I, we can, you know. Uh, Councilman Levin, you know, questioned about whether the, the differences between DSNY and the private cartage um, companies, and I don't see how we get, you know, I don't see how this isn't the central uh, driving issue here, and the idea that there are no consequences, or seemingly, I haven't yet heard, I've been here, you know, I'm a private citizen, I've been sitting here for three and a half hours, I have yet to hear any real consequences for anybody. Um, it's kind of shocking to me. I have been consistently outraged by the death of Nef Neftali Ramirez this summer. I think that um, I think it's unfortunate that NYPD has not been a part of today's discussion. Um, I found in the uh, there was a safety uh, North Brooklyn safety meeting back in August. I know that Mr. Arono from BIC was there, NYPD was there, but didn't really contribute anything. And they're a big part of this question uh, in terms of enforcing traffic safety. Greenpoint at night is a, um, you know, I had written down Wild West b before Steve Levin said it, but that is, there's no way to get away from that comparison. Um, trucks are going absolutely the wrong way down the street. And as far as this group that I moderate, 5,000 people, we're constantly taking pictures and sharing them of, of the outrages that we encounter all the time. I think BIC, for its part, could and uh, could do a lot more in terms of, of uh, outreach and intersecting with the community instead of saying, oh, you guys should email us. Well, there there is a lot of community activity on Facebook already with people sharing very clear documentation of uh, infractions. And I mean, I'm, I'm there constantly reminding people to email you. But it's, an, it's that extra step that makes it very hard. I think there has got to be some way for uh, the community to be more, to be given an easier uh, way to be active participants. The community members are the ones who see this more than anybody. We are walking our streets at night, we're riding our bikes, we're you know, doing whatever, but we are the ones who see and are consistently outraged by the behavior of these trucks. I don't personally, um, in, in terms of the issue between the drivers and the companies, I mean, I think it's very difficult. And I think when you hear about the hours and you understand the burden of work, you know, it's, it's hard to say. I know that I have no problem whatsoever uh, expecting these companies to face consequences when uh, lives are at stake. Action carting, for instance, five people died in the last 10 years. And in terms of Neftali Ramirez, I'd like to point out that his, I don't believe his case has even, the investigation has been closed. So that information wouldn't yet have gone to BIC. It's four months later, he was killed. The neighbors have heard nothing, really have heard nothing. The DA has communicated very little to us. 
And so we're left feeling hopeless. It's, it's, hard to feel, um, it's hard to feel that we have the power that really we should have and that we would be grateful to have. So um, I, I'm grateful to you for making this a serious issue. And, um, and I'm grateful to you also for pointing out that when these incidents have happened, often it is the bike, bicyclists who are uh, focused on in, from the NYPD. I think it's just a culture that the NYPD looks at the cyclists to try to solve that problem. And when you're considering that they're the ones who are um, also in, you know, theoretically investigating the situation, it's hard to feel confident that the cyclists are, you know, there is Neftali Ramirez riding his bike home from work at whatever it was, midnight, and he's mowed down, and the NYPD, which, you know, it's, it's very hard to feel confident that the right things are being done, and I just want to say that I have not forgotten Neftali Ramirez, and so very many of my neighbors have not either, but we are not hearing back from the DA, from the cops, from, there has been no word at all about action uh, carding on this issue, and they've got 10 bodies under their belt in the last 10 years. So I just leave it at that. So we're going to follow up to get you as much information regarding uh, update with Neftali Ramirez. Um, we haven't forgotten either. Um, Vic is here. I hope that they join the group. That uh, can you state the name of the group on Facebook it, out loud? It, I'm already a member. Okay. Oh, I should be highlighting you then. Okay. So so they might not be receiving formal complaints um, because they have to track the formal ones, but um, I'm pretty sure they'll be keeping track of informal ones. But we have to figure out a way to make that connection easier. Um, so we'll have a conversation with Vic uh, about what happens there. Neighbors are, e are e eager to participate. They really are. The, we're the people who are on the streets, and we're the ones with our smartphones right there. So I, I'll, I'll speak right. to you after. That sounds great. And thank you so much. Thank and you. I appreciate it. And the NYPD stuff we're working on. I had a conversation with the commissioner recently about the situation with bikes in my district. Um, and it's very hard sometimes, for example, let's say in the Upper West Side, people want more enforcement on bikes. They want to remove all the e-bikes. They want to, you know, it's a different world all ent entirely. And then he has to communicate a completely different message to North Brooklyn NYPD, like the 90th precinct, that there's, a, and it's, he doesn't want to have two standards. He wants to figure out a way to make it a universal standard across the board, and in doing so, um, develops this culture that just isn't, doesn't work for North Brooklyn at all. So um, we're having those conversations. Don't think we're not, though. And we're also, we have a new, uh, we have a new commander of the 94th, which, uh, so I think that I feel hopeful that there, is, there are possibilities for, you know, a, a modified culture there as well. I hope that. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. I appreciate it. My name is Annabelle Short of Align, the Alliance for a Greater New York. Thank you, Committee Chairs Reynoso and Rodriguez for earlier for the opportunity to testify today. Align, as you know, is a member of the Transform Don't Trash Coalition, a diverse group of environmental labor, environmental justice, and community organizations advocating for fundamental reform of New York City's commercial waste system. Private sanitation fleet safety risks, as we've heard today, are a widespread problem which requires a systemic solution, one that gets to the roots, root causes of the risks and includes strong oversight. Reflecting the severity of safety concerns in this industry, between August 2015 and August 2017, according to federal data, there were 62 collisions involving the 20 largest private sanitation carters in New York City. Since April of this year alone, three New Yorkers have been killed by private sanitation trucks. At least eight have been killed since 2015. Also, as you've heard from sanitation truck drivers and helpers, accidents and injuries on the job are a routine occurrence. A survey of non-union drivers and helpers by NICOS, for example, found that they work between 9 to 19.5 hours per shift. 71% of those surveyed had been injured on the job, and 93% indicated that their employer provided no health and safety training. And these three photographs here of helpers riding on the back of the truck um, which is clearly something that would be included in health and safety trainings, um, shows how little those um, uh, trainings are really put into effect in practice. Clearly, the situation needs to change. A major cause of accidents is the lack of proper truck maintenance. According to U.S. DOT vehicle inspection data from 2014 and 2015, 96% of all safety violations identified in inspections of the largest waste haulers were for vehicle maintenance. 
3% were related to driver fitness and 1% on unsafe driving. Any approach to improving safety in the industry clearly needs to tackle truck maintenance head on to reduce the risks to workers, pedestrians and cyclists. When it comes to preventing accidents that are not related to truck maintenance, safety training for drivers can only go so far. When an industry model forces workers to drive long routes at night for many hours without a break, six or seven days in a row, extreme fatigue sets in. Fleet safety is inextricably linked to working conditions. This is why it's important that the city is moving towards a commercial waste zone system. By reducing inefficiencies in routes, the new system has the potential to reduce private sanitation truck traffic by up to 68%, which in itself will help dramatically decrease accidents. And in their contracts with the city, haulers will be held to high fleet management standards that promote clean, safe trucks and safe operating practices. In other words, the systemic solution that is so badly needed. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you for clearing up the statistics that I had um, but didn't understand them uh, too well regarding the inspection data from 2014 and 2015. Yep. But thank you for that, clearing that up. And that, that, is DO, that is US DOT doing inspections. Yes. Okay. And how many, do you know how many trucks? Um, or was it like every truck in the city of New York or was it just a, a fraction of them? That is a good question. We can look into it and okay. get back to you on Thank it. you. Thank you for that. I appreciate it. Okay. Um, my name is Justin Wood. Thank you very much, Chair Reynoso. Uh, thank you uh, in absentia to Chair Rodriguez and members of the Council. I'm testifying on behalf of New York Lawyers for the Public Interest and also on behalf of the Transform Don't Trash New York City Coalition. Um, and because I'm going last, I'm going to try to skip anything redundant here and, and cut to the chase. Um, we want to applaud the council for holding this hearing and also uh, applaud the Business Integrity Commission. I know, I know some folks from the BIC staff are still here um, for engaging with this issue and for, to BIC and DSNY for the agency leadership on this really historic and critical transition to a zoned commercial waste system that's been mentioned several times. I mean, for us, this is so critical because it ties together so many uh, vital issues to our city the need to divert waste and reduce greenhouse gases, this critical focus on both worker and public safety, um, and uh, the need to, to reduce the truck miles on our local streets for a variety of reasons. Um, I just want to, I'm going to skip around here a little and just highlight a lot of the issues that were brought up today are not new and they're well documented. So the testimony we've heard from workers and members of the public um, is really well documented going back years in city studies and that's why this council and this administration's engagement with reforming this system uh, is so historic and so crucial. Um, for starters, I mean the city's 2009 to 2012 study of the private carting industry uh, done by through a contract with a major engineering firm called Halcro. There were observers all over the city at night as part of that study. They found that these practices drivers use in order to meet grueling routes, um, again, with long distances between stops that we heard about in the private industry due to the inefficiency of the customer base, um, the backing up down one-way streets, speeding, reverse moves, illegal turns, all of those things were observed to be common. Obviously, we're hearing today that they're still common. And that stuff is probably going to keep going until we fundamentally uh, change the system to one that's more efficient. Finally, I just want to delve in a little bit. Um, it's really difficult with the number of BIC licensees and registrants, um, uh, dozens and dozens of companies in the putrescible sector, many more in the construction and demolition sector. It's really difficult for the city regulators under the current system to hold the haulers accountable. We heard a lot today. Um, I want to draw everyone's attention in the city's 2016 private carding study that looked a lot at the efficiency or inefficiency of the current system and the potential for a zoning system. Um, they found, looking through the big data, that there was significant underreporting of helpers compared to drivers in the industry. And, quote, this tended to support suggestions from a variety of sources that practices such as hiring helpers as casual employees, day laborers, paying them off the books, or having them informally hired by individual drivers is widespread. And just to stress, this is a huge problem we've heard about from workers and others in the industry. 
um, these off-the-books payment practices continue, it's totally incompatible with a rigorous worker safety training program. So if it's going to be more than a dog and pony show, we really need to look at how workers are treated. One more piece of data, and then I'll close. Uh, Transform Don't Trash NYC recently reviewed all of the Business Integrity Commission violations issued to private carters for the last three years. Um, and we found 351 different instances in the last few years where the haulers registered and licensed by BIC had not even reported the names of drivers or other employees to BIC. This is a part of the law. It's part of, as you heard, holding employees to standards of, uh, of integrity. Um, but again, this is a system where it's difficult, we imagine, for BIC with all of these different companies um, and, and not enough teeth in terms of penalties to even get the, the owners of the companies to share the employee list, the most basic legal, legal requirement. So uh, again, this is not compatible with this kind of behavior, with the kind of rigorous safety culture we need to develop. Um, in closing, I just want to echo what many others said. We're excited about the historic and long-needed reform of the industry that's, that's coming, going from the chaotic open market arrangement to a more open zone system. And we're really excited to work uh, on an ongoing basis with the council and the administration, um, some of the haulers, and uh, with the other advocates in making this uh, a reality in the next few years. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so you said 351 I guess summonses of violations were given to a company to companies because they didn't report uh, information on their drivers, so that bit can do their job. Yeah, right now uh, the the licensees and res registrants, uh, the C and D haulers, are required to share employee lists right, with BIC. Right. And uh, recently, after a FOIL request, we got all of these violations that don't go to court, so they're not publicly available, but it's, it's the violations that BIC is giving to companies that they typically settle. And for us, what was shocking was the number of instances. And, and my understanding is these, these trucks could have been pulled over for other reasons. It could be a routine inspection, maybe there's a traffic violation, and they're looking at the employees' driver's licenses and finding that the owners of these companies routinely um, and these are companies of all sizes, don't even share, uh, comply with that most basic requirement of the sort of anti-corruption laws right, from right. the 90s. So, I mean, we agree with uh, what the commissioner was saying earlier and what you've been saying. Mm -hmm. um, we need a real safety program with, with teeth. Um, we agree that, that the coming zoning system is a really good chance for the city to have leverage um, in, in rewarding the more responsible actors in the industry, protecting the workers, and uh, trying to end the irresponsible behavior in the industry. Absolutely. Outside of the uh, commercial way zones, which is going to be a priority for this, count, for this city um, in the next coming year, in the coming years, uh, worker safety is going to be my number one priority um, in ensuring that we can get there. I'm hoping that the environmental justice piece gets done very soon and quickly. Uh, but outside of that, worker safety has to take a, a priority. Uh, I thought by now we would have seen more change, and we have it, uh, and we really have to focus, uh, focus on it. So thank you so much for today, um, and as of now, this meeting is adjourned.